Hello, everyone, and welcome at 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament Pool 1. We have approached to the semi-finals and we have just one match left. I am Women Grandmaster Katie Tassel-Shirley and alongside with me is Grandmaster Arthur's uh, Nations. Uh, I am so happy to be joined to the uh, coverage of this tournament with you, Arthur, and we are going to be here two rounds in a row. Welcome. Right. Hello, Katie, and everybody else who is watching is an absolute pleasure. And we have reached the semi-final of the Women Candidates Tournament, the Pool A. So as you already know, this year it's a bit different uh, system, how they're playing it out. And uh, today we are going to have just one match of the semi-final match between Anna Muzichuk and Lei Ting Ji. But uh, before yeah. we check what is happening uh, in, in this match, and I do believe we have several minutes, Kathy, do we also could check uh, what are the previous world champions mm -hmm. among women? Yeah, this uh, the, the system of the women's world champion championship is changing sometimes, and there are lots of like different types. And uh, through all these years, we have here the uh, all the ladies on the screen who became the world champions. And we can see from two thousand eight and ten, we had Alexandra Kostnik for our viewers. She's well known streamer as well. Uh, then we have Ho Yufan. She got the title twice. Uh, first, she lost to Anna Oshanina and then she got it back. But for now, we know that she's not an active player anymore. Once in a while, she's joining uh, chess.com events and playing the tournaments here. And uh, we do have here um, a lot of uh, flags from China and Ukraine as well, right, Arthur? Like the most dominant for past few years were definitely Chinese players and also a current uh, champion is Ju Wenjun, who is waiting for her next opponent, the challenger, who might be one of our today's participants. And it's knows? actually interesting, Kitty, that you mentioned it. It's a dominance by Chinese and Ukrainian um, players. And also in today's match, of course, we again have uh, Marie, uh, Anna Muzichuk from Ukraine and Li Tingzhi is from China continuing the so-called dominance. And uh, they are two players of the eight player bracket. So let's maybe check. This is the three of all players who have reached woman candidate cycle. As you can see, we have reached the semifinal phase where Anna Muzichuk today is playing against Lei Tingzhi. You already probably were following the previous matches. There was this very, very dramatic match, Katie, right? When Anna managed to somehow defeat Konrad Humpi in a very exciting yes. match, which finished this, this crazy blunder, right? Queenie too. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. That yeah, I felt a bit guilty, Arthur, because th there was the moment when I was asking Irina, like, is there some kind of tactics out there? And she was like, no, no, not yet. And the moment we said that, then Bishop D2 happened on the board and it was unfortunate uh, blunder for Cornero Happy, which, in my personal opinion, just got exhausted for all everything which has happened here recently she won the first tournament in classical chess then was draws and then she lost the last one fourth one and then anna definitely used this chance and uh, how it there was really dramatic day there was truly dramatic day indeed let's take a look now at the uh, uh schedule of the matches and you know we can have some kind of um thoughts about today's match who, who will win first of all who is the favorite of our chat we can ask to this question to uh to our twitch and youtube viewers is your favorite player Anna Muzichik or Lei Tingji let us know who do you think gonna win today and also Arthur's we were talking before the show the um possible opening what do you think what opening we're gonna see today I would say it's uh, maybe I'm going to be bold. I'm going to say it's 95% Petrov. Why is this? Because all of the games so far in this candidate cycle, which started with E4, they had the Petrov defense. And Anna Muzichuk played it uh, before uh, against Konoru Humpi. Also, her sister Maria Muzichuk played it against Li Tingzhi. So mm -hmm. I think it's a, a fair bet that we are going to get some kind of a Petrov, but we are going to talk about it a bit later. And uh, I do see the players I've seated. Mm -hmm. 
at the table. So maybe let's very quickly check the format of the uh, candidate cycle because it's a uh, uh, first game of the match. So the players are playing against each other a mini match. Yeah, that's right. This is just the first one. We're going to have uh, three more games uh, beside this one. The time control is a classical time control. Uh, 19 minutes plus 30 seconds for each move. And after move 40, they're going to get extra 30 minutes on the clock. And there is a Sophia rule, which means that there will be no draw uh, agreements uh, before 40 moves. They can repeat the position for three uh with uh three times uh and an arbiter will fix that as a draw but they cannot agree on a draw without playing the moves right indeed so very very um exciting day is gonna gonna be ahead of us so maybe slightly slower than usual because we have reached the semi-final phase just one game so i imagine we are gonna learn all the ins and outs of the petrov right so we are gonna take it slow explain you move by move mm -hmm. What was played before? I also have gathered the list of their previous encounters here in this candidate cycle. And why actually, Katie, you know why I do believe it's going to be Petrov? Because in the preparation phase, I do believe they're preparing like big concepts. So I find it very, very hard to believe that, for example, Anna has prepared E4 and, for example, D4 uh, at that level for just one tournament. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's really uh, interesting how these players at this level are having the op opening repertoire. They can play any move, first move, E4, D4, Knight, F3, and still be very good. Uh, but my guess is also Petrov for some reason. And also we have some kind of like side information about Anna Muzichuk. Uh, she's here with her coach, Grandmaster Yuri uh, Krivoruchanko, who is uh, very close to be 2700 player. His rating for now is 2680 Grandmaster from Ukraine. And that's not only one Grandmaster. She is helped to, to this uh, tournament, but also her sister now joins the team of uh, of the coaches or the second and Maria still remains in Monaco she's staying here and definitely supporting her sister right and I'm not really sure who is helping Leighton G but I checked the opening um, um, repertoire of um, all of the leading Chinese men players and guess what Getty most of them playing the Petrov so I'm talking about Wang Hao, Wang Yu, <laughs> Li Chao so Petrov defense is a regular thing in their opening repertoire so I would say it's a very very good guess that some of the somebody of them or maybe all of them all are of helping them. the countrymen yeah can be really can be that's that's the open question to also to our chest to the speculation on the screen now we can see honorary guests and this is miss marlene harnois who is an olympic medalist can you guess the sport in which sport she is medalist i'll guess skiing it's a taekwondo <laughs> <laughs> okay, not really. Yeah, close. you were a bit far, you know, <laughs> just a bit more. And uh, she is also representative of Champions for Pe uh, Peace Club at uh, Peace and Sports. Uh, so uh, today we had uh, this guest who made the first move and the photo. And here we have a handshake. And this is the moment of truth. Is it? E4 first move, it is E4. Should be no surprise, Kelly. I, I'm yeah. pretty, pretty sure it's going to be E5 because also Leighton G, she prepares an entire concept. No! There you go. Okay. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Arders, look at this. Um, I looked at the openings here of Leighton uh, G and after E4, her main move is e5 indeed, but she also plays c5 quite a lot. Right. Well, I saw. I saw obviously that she played c5 before, uh, but this is still quite unexpected for me. And the e6, there you go. This is actually business. This means business also for, for us, Katie, for the viewers, because we're like preparing. It's going to be a long day of the quiet Petrov. And there you go, my 95% prediction goes out of the window and actually <laughs> have a fighting repertoire here. Not that I have anything against the Petrov, but this is a bit more lively. 
<laughs> yeah, what can be the reason of that, uh, Arthur? My guess is that letting, letting G and her team of seconds and coaches has observed the games of Anna. Anna plays played so far very nice games with in patrol right and she won the match against conor humpy so i think they just wanted to switch a little bit the directions and go to sicilian at this time yes and definitely you can see anna is surprised she's definitely surprised i mean i'm pretty sure that her coach uh, Yuri Krivorochko and sister were helping in the past two days at least, trying to figure out what exact system against the Petrov we should choose because Anna played the Petrov against, I mean, Humpy played Petrov against uh, Anna, and also Li Tingji exclusively played Petrov against her sister Marie. And there you go, suddenly you have the Sicilian. And of course, she mm -hmm. has prepared, but this is not what she was expecting today. Yeah, I also catch that look of Anna uh, and she had a sip of the uh, iced tea. Um, just to pause a pause a moment, yeah, she's she might be in a shock. For sure, She there was some percentage that she was uh, 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 waiting this to happen and for sure they have preparation here. But um, yeah, you know, at, before the start of the game, we always have a hope that our opponent will play some... Uh, some opening and when it's not happening then you're taking a little bit of uh silent time and just thinking how to uh process the, the game mm, right so anna i do believe Katie, she is a more a positional player at least the way mm -hmm. i i have always understood how she plays so of course d4 I mean, d4 has got to be the main principled move. And after d4, I think black has a number of numerous ways to get the shop game. But here is actually a turning moment for Anna because she could play something more quiet. Like there is a Lapin, which promises white uh, a very small but annoying pressure. There's also what I like, g3. I actually gave it a title because I released a database mm -hmm. a long time ago. I even called it the Baltic system because many players Which from the Baltic the... countries are playing this. Baltic? Yeah, I called it. I mean, I ah. had to invent a title because there was no timeline, so <laughs> I'm going to invent a title. So I said, it's going to be a Baltic system because I said it first. But the big point is, for example, G3, if black responds with something like D5, takes, takes, D4, white gets a very nice, quiet game. And maybe here Anna is considering this, but you can see she is definitely surprised. Yeah, and uh, it, that takes her like three minutes to think her next um, move. The thing is that she can she can play here several moves, like right. D four is the main move, but she can also go with C three here. Yes, uh, and to play, and she can also go with Knight C three. I think once she played knight c3 against me and then she tricked me in the opening and then i found myself in the position that i have never played in my life so there are possibilities so what are your thoughts Getty? maybe let's say imagine of course you are also a professional chess player you have been in anna's shoes many mm -hmm. times your opponent in a very important match in a very important game suddenly surprises you what are you thinking i mean what's your first thought probably it's something like what has she prepared probably right oh um, yeah actually my first thought would be like poker face don't show that you didn't expect it is just just stay cool that's the first thing i would i would do because i'm a very emotional person and you can read out on my face how i feel so that would be in my personal uh situation in personal case but with anna uh I, I can visibly see that she is not uh she's surprised with this choice of letting Lee. And um as this is the first game and she has white pieces, I would expect something very sharp. But also we can see now G3 that also tells us that she's not going to the main line, she's going to the sideline where she thinks just to uh, run the game, you know, just to have a slight edge and then uh, to control the whole game. But Knight C6 just happened in a second after G3 move. This is good news for us because I know quite a bit, obviously, about this line. Uh, and uh, Knight C6 is um, 
one of the uh, possible combinations that uh, black can choose. I, I think that black has a couple of very critical combinations here. So the point again of G3, uh, so that to explain the concept that Anna has chosen, the point is to be quite flexible with the D pawn push. So after G3, black needs to understand what she's going to do is she going to play d5 very aggressive in the center for example there's this line d5 takes takes now you have to play d4 otherwise black is going to play d4 himself so for example d4 and uh there's some lines where black very very aggressively tries to force you to take on c5 for example d takes bishop c5 mm -hmm. and we have a quite a typical IQP position, IQP meaning is isolated queen's pawn position on d5, and white is slightly, slightly better and trying to get to this pawn. But here, what, what I find it to be interesting, leading g played pretty quick, knight c6, bishop g2, knight f6, and this means she probably has anticipated this, or maybe she just played it fast and she's sending a signal, I'm ready to this as well. What do you think, Eddie? Uh, this can be that what you just meant. Uh, chess is pretty much the psychological game. And when your opponent knows that you're well prepared, that's, you know, a lot of questions starts. And you might think like, oh, she's well prepared today. Maybe I can try the next game. So there can be just these moments of bluff. But of course, you need to think and you need to you need to know you will not blitz out the moves like knight c6 or knight f uh six because um this is not the opening you play every day it's not petro right to be more or less like peaceful this is sicilian defense and the position can get uh very sharp very soon here right and i also like Anna's choice here to play knight c3 so knight mm -hmm. c3 is not the only move i treat this position there is two major moves here one of them is knight c3, which I treat as the strongest move. And also pretty popular is queen e2. And after queen e2, there's a number of ways how black can play it out. For example, let's say black plays something like d5, which is, of course, a very uh, natural response. You want to take the center. But this position actually is incredibly tricky because we do get mm -hmm. some sort of a king's Indian attack where white has not played knight e2, but queen e2 with ideas like e5, c4, knight c3, and an easy initiative for white. Yeah, this looks very good position, to be honest. Uh, uh, I, I never like this kind of positions when pawn is on e5, uh, which tells me that my opponent is going to attack on the king side. Uh, and this pawn also kicks the knight from f6, uh, which on the other side le left, um, leaves the black king on g8 all alone. And it's never comfortable for me. And I know for many players to castle short very soon in in this kind of a, a structure, yeah? Sometimes we're just waiting for a bit. Maybe you can castle on the long side. Um, I, th I think we do have some more moves in the game. Let's see what happened here. Yeah, so Black decided to play d5, which is, um, I do believe, the principal move. The other uh, big choice that Black can uh, choose here is to play bishop e7, castles, castles, and play d6. But then again, this mm -hmm. position is um ah, let's say castle castle and let's say i play d4 c takes 94 and we do get some sort of um i'm not sure what this is really some sort of a uh, diamond of paulson system where why play g3 bishop g2 and sometimes black goes very early bishop b4 to disturb your presence in the center and here black simply didn't do it so mm -hmm. this is choice number one and choice number two again is to go for a quiet King's Indian attack, knight g5, knight h3, f4, g4, g5, or the same with the knight on d2. So that's why d5. Yeah, uh, and Arthur's I was just checking the games so of Lating G if she has played this before, and she has played this opening three times at least. And knight c3 is something new. Uh, no one has played knight c3 against her. There was queen to d e2 here in this position to guard the pawn on e4 and also kind of avoid d5, and there was also d3. But she mm -hmm. went d5 rather fast, so this seems to be her preparation here. She's going for the center, and I think we do have isolated pawn on the board. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely. And you know, Kathy, now that you mentioned this, uh, I recall that one of the experts, I remember when I was uh, working on this uh, course, one of the experts of this file is Lu Shanglei from The Wise Perspective. So he was one of the first uh, professionals uh, okay. in the modern modern times who started to popularize this line. And well, I think there's some connection, right? So Lu Shanglei yeah. from China, uh, Li Tingzhi from China, maybe also in some capacity, he has joined it. I don't know, I'm guessing it, but. He is, mm -hmm. Lucian Glay is playing this from the wise perspective. He's also heavily, uh, not heavily, but he was trying to popularize the move knight c3. So the point is d5, d5 takes, takes. Now white has to play d4 to counter the center. And c takes on d4, not really necessary. Bishop g4 is also a move, but these moves were played there on the board. Mm -hmm. That is right. Uh, about they are playing so fast they're like literally blitzing out today's uh game and i i was like for a moment are we today really in a classical portion of a day or a rapid version of a day because we have already so many moves played so fast and uh, some changes will happen quite soon Artur's, uh i i just checked the games of anna muzichuk and at this point i don't see any g3 move after third, uh, only yeah, third move. I'm pretty sure she didn't invent it. Uh, it was part of her preparation. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe, when, once again, we go back to this moment when uh, she played G3. Maybe mm -hmm. she was um, uh, choosing, once again, what's the right approach. Because essentially, D4, Kerry, I do believe it's you're going after... The, the bull immediately, you're trying to go for a big fight, for example, after d4, takes, takes. Uh, there's this variation, quite risky for black to play d6, and literally taunt you to play the Keras attack with g4, which again leads to uh, a very, very crazy game. And Anna probably felt that, okay, this is not the right time to play this because this is the first game of the mini match. I mean, the match mm -hmm. strategy, it's really important. So, okay, let's make something quiet and i think Li she is playing also a bit fast to apply some extra pressure against her opponent and so that she doesn't know how far the preparation goes yeah i agree with this this is something uh something very interesting what is happening i do like anna's choice to play j3 first of all it's something uh n not very popular line uh, and maybe the opponent is not prepared to that you never know uh, and uh, also all the other moves that she has played here d4 c4 knight c3 bishop e2 even b4 c3 and d3 i named so many moves right she has played all of these so very likely late G was prepared for all these moves and maybe anna just wanted to get her out of her books and play g3 and uh, at this point when lay plays so fast all these moves what do you think what is happening right now to anna's mind uh there's definitely some psychological pressure and mm -hmm. uh you can see also the body language of letting g she's all about business right so i think she wants to um take it on a, a bit psychological level right so she knows that playing something unexpected definitely has some psychological value so she played it fast she played something unexpected anna still tries to play positional game she keeps rolling forward so i mean in chess uh, i think Katie, you're gonna agree right the uh, psychology plays a huge part maybe 30 40 percent so it's uh, nice uh, it's good for the players sometimes to uh apply extra pressure like mm -hmm. this and uh, yeah, I think agreed. Tatana is not feeling not feeling very very comfortable right now. Mm -hmm. But I, I I think still the position is quite um, quite uh, balanced. And now I think Queen D three should be pretty much automatic choice. To be honest, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, not totally sure why she has stopped because Queen D three is a very common way uh, to get rid of this uh, attack on D one. And then Black plays. I think it was Bishop C five. Uh, Black is really inviting you to take on c6 and if i remember correctly there was this check on e3 which was pretty important for whichever reason i think it was yeah king of eight was bad because knight e6 check i conquered this bishop which somehow is important 
uh queen e7 was worse for some reason i don't remember maybe it was something like take queens knight b3 win the pawn and the big idea was that black plays bishop e7 castle castle and white plays back queen d3 and then i don't remember to be honest <laughs> that's uh tricky yeah you play first play bishop uh, queen to e3 to uh force black to play this bishop e7 more like more or less passive move there and then you castle and bring this queen back on d3 this is this is heavy theory in our terms we have queen to d3 on the board so all right uh, now remembers this line she's going for that um let's let's talk a little bit about moves like f3 obviously she's not going to play but um for many of us these kind of moves are so easy to play right instead of queen to d3 and why this can be so bad to play why is what bad to play f3 f3 instead of queen d3 yes uh you know i don't know i mean maybe f3 is a reasonable move and uh mm -hmm. perhaps i'm a bit outdated but i think the concept is a bit wrong because um for example black retreats with the bishop for example something like bishop h5 or bishop d7 it's difficult to tell what immediately white could suffer a bit because of this uh, weakness so you need to be careful of some tactical tricks let's say short castle uh bishop c5 queen b6 that could be a mm -hmm. problem maybe it's actually fine you know i look at the bar the bar says you know what are you talking about you this are a... you are more than good here in this position yeah bar is not agreeing on us right right so i mean okay but <laughs> oh, from the perspective from the uh, positional perspective wise i don't like f3 maybe something has really changed i do believe that queen d3 is the uh, the normal move because once again here instead of queen d3 something like knight f3 or knight e2 this is just going back and there should be like a rule for your pieces don't voluntarily go back it should be really that simple go forward yeah this move is something not very pretty looking to be honest i like f3 more than knight t because like you pin yourself and then you allow d4 to happen so f3 has okay it weakens the diagonal but it has idea castle and then to give a check rookie one very quickly you just need two moves and black is a bit slow on on uh, on development too uh and when we we agree that this f3 move is just weird looking then 92 looks even 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 worse than f3 to be honest there uh, so bishop to c5 has happened now the knight on d4 is hanging how many opportunities this knight has to to, um, to play yeah there's definitely their knight retreat i think anna should know queen e3 check uh, maybe she's just trying to remember because you don't play g3 at the FIDE candidates tournament without a good idea of what's happening here. This is a pretty <laughs> popular line in this sideline, Kerry. I mean, I've played it online many times. Um, I, I don't recall the actual theory, to be honest. I remember that this queen e3 chick was important, but I guess you could play something like knight b3 but you need to have a pretty good idea what you're going to do after queen e7 check because suddenly you know you don't have very good way to cover from the check so bishop e3 spoils your pawn structure you need to watch out for some d4 ideas knight e2 creates a pin and king f1 well it's just looking ugly it does look ugly and uh, i would be starting to worry to to play in this position with white as blacks all pieces are so perfectly placed and white has a bit of uh this coordination between the pieces so that might bring us to the, uh, back to the position when knight is on d4 and uh how about to trade the knight on c6 get some uh time and then castle um right away after this move and to have this position you know this pawn on c6 and d5 they can be uh targets of whites like for instance something like knight a4 c4 mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely um uh, i think this is definitely a viable plan um i would imagine maybe it can be combined with something like uh b3 bishop b2 knight a4 c4 but then again you know i look at this position Kerry, and uh, i don't have um, any illusions that this is creating any problems for black okay it's a playable position but black appears to be in complete order so let's put
put it this way. I think Anna is looking at this like, okay, I can always play knight c6. I'm definitely not worse. There's this easy plan to execute. But am I going to win this game? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult. So what about what about something more central based like bishop e3? I'm looking at this and I have no recollection of this line. Can I, can I play yeah, bishop this... e3? This looks actually very good. At least the threat is knight c6 now with... Uh... Uh, with the uh, idea to win a piece, so black has to watch out for that. You develop another another piece, uh, and uh, for for now there's not also check on the board. Queen e seven was quite unpleasant check, uh, so, but then the question comes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's the question oh. I, I thought you were gonna ask, right? I was thinking about to take the knight on d4, bishop takes, and then queen e7 after that. Oh, that's a different idea. Take it, queen e7 check. We still have the same issues. Now, bishop e3 mm -hmm. runs into d4. You don't do that. You can't take yeah. it. You lose a piece. So king f1. Huh. Yeah, and then I guess you just castle, sacrifice the pawn on d5 if you have to. And while white king is going to try to make an escape, it's going to be a long time. And black is going to do something during this time. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know what? Okay. Yeah. I was looking at queen b. I'm sorry. I think they played already. No, they did not. I no. was looking at queen b6. This felt to me as something something really challenging uh, attacking this knight on c6. And the point is you always need to watch out for knight a4. But I have no idea what's happening here after queen b4 check. Probably nothing good to white. Yeah, those two knights on fourth rank, one of those knights probably going to be lost. As, uh, yeah, you can't really hold it. You have to play knight to c3, and then you're going to lose the knight on d4. So queen b6 looks uh, quite tempting. On the other hand, the pawn on b2 is something that you can always just be careful, and you have to spend some time to calculate any kind of capture possibilities in that position. Uh, so, yeah, that's... That you... might not be very necessary, right, to go there. I'm not even sure what white's supposed to do here. Because if I have to take on c6, why did I play this entire sequence? Then I just take on c6 right away. Now, that's why Anna is thinking here. That's why she's thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, does she know queen e3 idea? I think this was the entire reason, entire purpose of this queen e3. Now that I remember, once again, to play queen e3 check, Force black to play knight e7 after the short castle, castle, then you go back. But okay, maybe my memory is uh, just failing me. And after knight c6, <laughs> you have these options once again, either to take on c6 or play something like knight b3 or again play bishop e3 because now after queen b6, there's knight f4. Look at that. Yeah. And it looks that looks much better with the castle uh, in this position. So it seems like. We have solved all the problems with castling here for white, right? So white just needs one more move to castle the king, and then white's gonna play very pleasant position against the isolated pawn. So that's why black's moves, bishop g4, uh, bishop c5, they are so aggressive. They are giving no time to white to um, finalize the development, and that's very, very nice approach. Yeah, and also one thing about these positions, Katie, I, I've watched the previous games in this candidate cycle so far, and uh, the game which brought Anna the seat in the semifinal was this very aggressive semi tarash idea where you sacrifice the pawn on d5, you know? And I look at this position, and I can't help but feel this is very similar, right? Black plays it out mm -hmm. very aggressive. She's not going to defend the pawn on d5. I think Black is not even thinking about how to keep the pawn on d5 alive. And instead, Black is going to do everything she can to get a very aggressive game, to get initiative, and if necessary, just give away the pawn away. Uh, on d5 yeah i think there will be still some kind of initiative after that upon gi giveaway i was just thinking artists to see this happening in the style of anna anna has been known on twitch community as a miss solid as i remember uh some time ago she was uh, streaming with her friend elizabeth Pats, and they had fun shows and uh yeah anna was definitely this so, so solid part of the team uh and then we saw her uh two days ago against connor hamby in the tie breaks uh of quarterfinals and she was the player who was uh who was looking for like 
even small chances to fight and she was showing another side of her and today back to the back to the classical chess and we have back solid anna so i have a feeling that she has these two chess personalities and she's adjusting it according what how how much time she has on the clock right yeah that she might be indeed um yeah while she's choosing i'm not really sure what she's choosing now probably if she doesn't know queen e3 it could be pretty tough for her mm -hmm. to find anything else maybe she's considering knight b3 queen e7 once again we talked about this knight b3 queen e7 king f1 you know maybe this is also something that is taking her attention maybe we can mention very quickly Katie, what's their previous um result because um uh, they haven't really played so many games between each other. Anna mm -hmm. was a choke against Lee Ting Ji. They have played uh, only two games, and they're not classical. It's just one rapid, one blitz back from the 2019 World Rapid and Blitz Championships, and that's it. They have never met before, unless they played last week somewhere, which I don't know about. The database <laughs> confirms <laughs> this is the first classical game. Yeah, that's actually very interesting uh, statistics. Uh, the thing is that Leiting G is 25 years old and Anna Mizuchik is uh, 32 years old. So they have not played, uh, obviously, the youth and junior championships. Um, and uh, the, the most of the tournaments that players are playing each other is the World Rapid and Blitz tournament, right? And then Grand Prix and the candidates and so on. Uh, I can see um, only one uh, world championship cycle that Lei Tingli has played. Nowadays, we call that World Cup. So uh, that's the tournament when you have the opponent and if you, you play two games and if you win, you go to the next round. And she was knocked out in the first round in that tournament. So then they, they have not met. And also, I, don't, I can't really recall if she was in the Grand Prix cycle before this year. So that can be the main reason why they have not facing each other. She Ooh, Anna. is... I mean, Anna, Anna, not Lettingly, I, I meant Lettingly, because ah, Anna has been, Anna has been around at, at all the events for many, many, many years. Um, but the reason why I have not played probably is because of the age and um, because of the different tournaments that they, they, they were played. And also, it's very interesting, um, the reason how uh, Letting G got qualified here that's the tournament which has happened last year uh fide women's grand swiss tournament she won that event and then she got the right to play in the uh, candidates tournament for the first time yeah and she just demolished the field i remember i think it was something like nine out of 11 because the the fide grand swiss of 2021 which was held in riga i also <laughs> happened to play in the men's section it was i guess one of the toughest experiences of my life so uh she... oh, wait you played as well yeah right? i played i played <laughs> i had a good taste of the some of the some of the strongest players really so it was incredible <laughs> experience very very tough and um leading g she demolished the women's field completely uh i think it was at like 1.5 difference ahead of everybody else and this is how she qualified mm -hmm. so she's all about business she's young she's uh very uh talented obviously and uh wouldn't be uh, the first uh, Chinese uh, player to become a world champion because Chinese uh, uh, players are faring really well, uh, especially women chess. Uh, how many world champions do they have? To be honest, I can't tell from memory. It's definitely Ho Yifan. It's the reigning world champion, Yu Wen Yun, and uh, Tan, Tan Zhongqi, at least three. Yeah. Maybe there was somebody else. Uh, Zhu Chen is also uh, Zhu Chen. the... Yeah, right. is the And who, who is here, in fact, uh, um she, Set, she's as well tournament. i remember yeah six world champions somebody says in the chat might be i'm i don't want to confirm that but, six uh, world champions from china that's an incredible number indeed yeah we saw on our our list which has uh we had on the screen just the very beginning of the show how how chinese players and ukrainian players are dominated indeed this uh field and uh, uh, we don't know, maybe we're looking at those 
at the player who will challenge the Juve in June. We don't know that, uh, but also Arthur's another pool, pool B, going to start soon, uh, just a few weeks later. And then it's going to be the same system. Four players going to play um, uh, the same um, uh, kind of tournament. And then the winner of this pool, pool A and winner of the pool B, going to face each other in the finals. And that's how we can define the challenger of the world champion. So that's quite a lot, long, long process. And probably Juven June is uh, following all this um, process. Why not? Yeah, I imagine. I imagine definitely. It also. Uh, I think it's the same also at the men's section that uh, the world champion Mark Duskalsen also is very closely following. He's also interested. It's also a very important event for him. Also for, I believe, for the woman world champion, Juven Yun, she is following what's happening here. Maybe already making some preparations, some notes. I don't know. But going back to the position, Kitty here, Knight B3. Now, this was chosen by Anna, and I could immediately tell from the body language uh, Black is out of the book, right? I mean, something about it like, like this. I mean, it's like um, um, trying to recall mm -hmm. something, but I think yeah. the bottom line is you're on your own, right? So Knight B3, I don't think this is the main move. So the big question is what actually happens after Queen E7? I mean, this has got to be the most principled choice. Otherwise, the pot on E4 is under some serious pressure. What about what about Queen E7 yeah. check? Do we play King F1 or Bishop E3? What do we do? Yeah, that's that's surely the principal one. Like then White has to respond here. And to be honest, I don't really, really know. I have seen I can see now two moves here, Bishop B3 and Bishop King 2 F1 has happened. That's the online database that I can see. Um but yeah, King F1 leads into the a lot of complication, to be honest. Um, because black can play then d4 and fight for the center, right? And maybe bishop e3. But you know, Katie, I look at this position and I notice one thing there is a pawn sacrifice which might lead to a crazy game after d4. Uh, you have to take on c6 unless I'm terribly mistaken. <laughs> so, how do you protect the piece? And bishop e3 is on the board. Look at this. So, Ooh. do we take on c6 or how do we protect the piece? Because not e4, you lose a piece, right? This is this is bad. Yeah, this is bad. You you just lose a piece because that's that's a pin. So you need to take right very quickly. Looking at this, I think you need to take on c6, b takes mm -hmm. on c6, and not knight e4. Take on c5. Take on c5 or take on d4. Because if you take on d4, can I play rook to d8 to pin the knight? Yes. This is a very good compensation for Black. I think it's very risky choice for Rana to go somewhere there. I'm pretty sure that she's not going to go there. She's looking towards something like knight c5. Yeah, OK. After knight c5, how about now to take the bishop on e3 and prepare e takes f, queen takes. And to go to this end game, uh, white going to have extra pawn, right? So that's going to be at least enough to feel okay in this position if not more i think white is just better to be honest yeah. i i'm not uh, not gonna argue maybe there's some compensation for black but even if i play let's say king d2 knight e3 b3 and just pray everything is gonna be good mm -hmm. it, it's a pawn and uh, i don't see any direct attacks so after bishop right. b3 maybe maybe it's actually not so good once again let's check this so d4 d4 we take it right take it and not knight e4 because knight e4 yeah, knight then indeed it, yeah knight c5 and i might be actually willing to take on c3 to keep the queens alive so i sacrifice the pawn d takes on c3 something like queen takes and a short castle. And the big question here, Kerry, is is black having enough compensation? Do you go here at all? Uh, in my opinion, this can be a, a compensation because look at the light squares on the king side. Bishop from G2 is gone. So black gonna black gonna have some kind of nice counterplay. Uh something like uh h5, h4, bishop f3. 
um, 95, this kind of move, sometimes you are just looking for this kind of opportunities to have, right? Uh, white has an extra pawn in the don't be uh, two, but so far I don't see a clear plan how white is using that. And also pieces are just more active for black. Uh, we see the engine says like, that's fine. It's extra pawn and I can guard this position, but it is engine. The engine can see unbelievable moves or sometimes switch the mind who can judge. Uh, so, but for human perspective, I think this can be quite comfortable to play with black. Mm, yeah, I guess it depends who is playing with white. If uh, white is comfortable <laughs> that uh, black has a short term uh, <laughs> initiative, and yeah. uh, she's uh, if she's comfortable that a pawn is a pawn, there's this beautiful knight on c5. And if she's confident there's not going to be a checkmate, maybe Anna is feeling pretty good. I, I think she is feeling pretty good about this position because at this level, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any toss of the coin. So she's definitely ready for d4. And maybe actually now it's uh, Li Ting Ji's uh, chance. Uh, to make a very big choice, and definitely she's after the book. You could see from the body language, knight b3, yeah. like this. Okay, what what's going on? Obviously, queen e7 check is one of the big motives here, and I'm after bishop e3. I don't think, I don't think she's gonna take on e3. Maybe I'm mistaken though. Take, take. Mm -hmm. Although why not? By the way, I felt this is slightly worse, but now that I look at this, maybe this is not worse at all. Um, it it looks pretty for me for black because e3 pawn is also weak, as weak as d5 pawn to my eyes. Black has captured the bishop on e3, so she is going for uh for an end game. Anna very quickly captured with a queen. Indeed, she doesn't want to capture with a pawn because when queens are on the board, white king will be definitely uh, weaker because then pawn from f2 will be gone. Um, and Anna is ready to go to the to the um, to the end game here at this point. Um, Arthur, I was checking with the engine what possibilities black could have here instead of bishop e3 and engine suggests to castle here for black uh and Which one? to sacrifice the bishop on yeah on the short side uh to sacrifice the bishop on c5 and when knight takes on c5 then to play d4 what who play like that uh, yeah <laughs> that, that is That's that is crazy. pretty weird that is pretty weird no you don't agree with me can it here because i mean your opponent plays nine to be three your natural reaction is okay what should i do so the first thought process can i play d4 i mean here instead of the castle mm -hmm. you try to work out d4 you look at this maybe five ten minutes okay you see the same game down upon not really clear then you look towards some other ideas like bishop e3 queen e3 to try to value the same game see the long castle etc and since you are a well-taught person maybe you're looking for a third candidate move which is maybe bishop b4 but come on short castle this is something <laughs> i would definitely miss <laughs> yeah short castle is um uh it's very weird looking move to be honest here you need to have home preparation for this one you can't really or you, you can you can just uh might not know the line but you need to feel it right you need to feel it so this craziness has not happened and it's not necessarily uh, true that it's, it's it's the good choice right this maybe this one is the better choice because as you mentioned artists here black can castle on the long side to guard the pawn on d5 or short side like you have these options I think long side uh, makes most sense because one of the things why people uh, not always castle long especially with the black color is because because the king is slightly exposed, right? You need like make one more move, king b8 to protect the pawn on a7. But we look at this position here. I mean, there's no queens, right? There's no mm -hmm. dogs with bishops, which would be uh, bothering black for these dogs with weaknesses. So that's why it makes perfect sense for black. Just remove the king from the center, use the rook to protect the pawn on the e5, while the king side rook is ready to join the action on e8 and create own ideas with the pawn on e3. Yep. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. So here we have uh, also 
faithfully in the chat saying that queens are off the board is gonna go this is close to the end game i can i call this kind of positions already the end games <laughs> to be honest and i'm starting to think now maybe maybe they will go easy in the classical portion but that's the question who will be more comfortable to like for instance to tie the match these four games and then to go to the uh rapid portion because we have seen what anna can do in that uh, segment uh, so yeah, what, what's your thoughts about this, uh, Arthur's? Um, not sure yet if they're gonna ease, go easy on the classical games. Uh, I would say that uh, so far, uh, Leiting G has um, managed to get more than Ana in the opening phase because one of the things, uh, one of the advantages, obviously, in the match strategy is that you're trying to make good use of your white color. So maybe. Most of you who are mm -hmm. watching this, you're thinking, what's the big difference, right? Play with white, black, yeah. whatever. But at this level, I mean, most of the competitive players, they're heavily relying on the white color, meaning you can direct the game in the direction you want to take it. You can prepare pretty deep. You have a lot of ideas. You have this very small minimal advantage. So that's why there is this a common saying with white play for the win with black play for the draw especially in matches so here that's why leading g's choice here to play the sharp sicilian that was like a big blow psychological blow to anna she's like what <laughs> okay i didn't mm. expect that she went for the quiet game with g3 but i think this entire idea once again let me go back here Kerry. after bishop c5 maybe knight b3 was not the best choice and perhaps anna had this match strategy in her mind it's like okay this is the first game this is not the most ambitious choice we discussed queen a3 being probably the most ambitious choice which is easy to miss if you don't know it mm -hmm. and then you immediately go to the same game black skips all of the tactical possibilities and i think after something like bishop h5 bishop g6 black should be pretty comfortable and uh quite equalish position not that white can uh not try to get something out of this yeah white might run out from the ideas here um what i can see is um something to attack the pawn on d5 and uh, black also can counterattack the pawn on e3 so we might have the end game where those two pawns are off the board and white gonna have the uh majority pawn on the queen side and black gonna have the uh majority pawn on the king side but pretty pretty equal position to be honest there is not too much weaknesses in both sides uh here um so they probably can are both of them are feeling quite safe in this end game the only thing Kathy, i'm not sure is and i think leading g is trying to work it out right now how to get the bishop on this diagonal right mm -hmm. do you play bishop five immediately or do you play bishop h5 and keep the white king in the center? So I think it's pretty sure for Leiting G. She knows the bishop belongs on this diagonal. Why? Because you're attacking the pawn on c2 and you're controlling the e4 square. That's why. So she's definitely not going to play something like bishop e6, bishop b7, because it's incredibly passive. And uh, the differences, mm -hmm. the small differences here is that after bishop h5, now white has access to some g4, g5 ideas. So that's why she needs to evaluate this really really carefully and if she plays bishop f5 this allows white to castle immediately for example bishop f5 long castle and the pawn on d5 is immediately under attack yeah that's right so uh, this g4 can be uh, can be the move that uh, maybe it's good for for white as you mentioned g5 next and to uh, get the pawn on d5 or i was also thinking how about to get this g4 pawn on g4 and then counterattack with h5 if we have that uh you know time for that and in case of g5 black can respond with something like 94 not to lose the pawn on d4 I'm not big fan of sacrificing pawns uh personally uh so here with this idea 94 you can't really take on d5 as i can see because knight f2 is a kind of fork uh and uh if you take with their rook you might just allow black to double the pawns on c file so there's a lot of things that black gotta take time here to consider all these lines and there is the difference between these two moves uh and obviously this decision right now can uh can bring the game in one direction 
Yeah, and also I don't think you can blitz it out because so far the players have played it pretty quickly. And again, I think this choice for Leiting G uh, to go for Bishop takes an e3, this says, okay, I mean, my psychology, the surprise in opening worked. My opponent played not the most ambitious continuation. Okay, let's just take it to the end game where I feel my chances are pretty good. Now, this is played pretty quick. This is a pretty easy move. And after h3, now this is the pretty much first choice that black faces right and uh, i think she wants to know yeah. something like five ten minutes because to remind you dear viewers yeah. the time control is 90 minutes for 40 moves then we have extra 30 minutes added to the clock after 40 moves can be made plus of course uh 30 seconds per made move and no draw agreed before move 40. no uh, without uh, repeating the position for three uh, times. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a little bit of like uh, pause time, but I can tell you one very interesting story that I have observed here uh, as I have this possibility to be at the tournament and just observe the situation. So far, um, uh, the players are pretty... Um, concentrated on the board uh like for instance also during the breakfast uh, they are always in a mode of like thinking i think and not having too much of the chat with the other people um and uh, yeah they are pretty much concentrating or sometimes even having uh, breakfast alone and then uh i have seen for instance uh maria muzicic been uh, more open after the match and uh, willing to enjoy the Monaco beautiful place that we are and all these faci uh, facilities that this hotel has and yeah um, in the whole city and also I saw Kornero Humphy she was um, she's still here as I know and she's also just um, enjoying this uh, place and I can just feel that players are more stressed when they are still in the competition and more open and i don't know more smiling when they when the competition is done for them yeah it's uh, definitely I imagine a very very stressful experience uh, mm -hmm. uh, definitely the higher level the highest level of the competition this means that you have to invest all of the time uh, to achieve the result, you can relax later. You know, Katie, from my experiences, come uh, the participation in some of the World Chess Olympiads. Well, let's put it this way one of the most difficult tournaments ever to play because usually it goes like you are preparing in the evening, you're preparing in the morning, uh, you have obviously the meals, mm -hmm. some little rest, you go to the game, there's the evening meal, there's a preparation, preparation, mm -hmm. preparation. So it, it's non stop. But of course, I mean, we could argue, and probably it is like this, that they have mainly prepared prior to the match. Still, I do believe they're doing something before, like meeting with the coach, discussing the tactics, and you're all about this match. When it's over, when you're <laughs> out, okay, then you enjoy the beauty of Monaco. Yeah. Yeah, you just you just breathe <laughs> you just let the stress go on uh here we have a couple more moves and g uh Leiting g has chosen bishop to f5 she was attacking the pawn on c2 and white could not play g4 anymore because the pawn was hanging and white had to kind of play this castle uh to to guard the pawn there and anna has played pretty fast this move and look at these archers the time situation is almost balanced right now letting g had uh, some edge at the beginning because we have seen uh this uh, bit of different opening that we all expected uh that cost some time to anna but now they are more or less equal on the clock and letting g is pretty relaxed isn't she right so she's playing pretty fast also, mm -hmm. Anna is playing pretty fast because uh, they have the same time on the clock, but uh, I'm a bit surprised. I would have thought that you could feel the weight of this tournament, that this is the first game of the semifinal, yet they're like getting used to this. And the rookie, eight, by the way, the move itself is pretty logical. You attack the pawn on e3, and there's like an invitation to do mass trades, uh, which probably... I think it's a very valid question, by the way, Kerry. What happens after 95? Is it really a lot of trades? I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, let's just see here. At some point, Arthur Third can be knight before move to like to to attack the pawn on c2 and to attack the piece on d5, whatever piece mm -hmm. it can be, or bishop c2 right away, then mm -hmm. to play knight before fork. 
So let's see, bishop takes on d5. Um, oh, okay, I'm a bit too lazy to calculate this. <laughs> can I? Can I, <laughs> can I do this? Can I do this? My gosh, this is a fork, right? It should be good. It's a fork. It looks pretty nice. You got city pawn, very healthy, good looking pawn, and you kept e3 weak pawn on the board. So okay. that's good. Okay. So I bishop after bishop c2. I guess this should be the critical choice. Yeah. Right now, bishop takes the rook. Bishop takes the rook, and you have this bishop b3. Move. And it could uh, defends the pawn on on mm -hmm. f7. I guess black is just better. Actually, it works for black. So it took yeah. me it took me about forty seconds. Yeah, <laughs> and right. you wish you never said that you were a bit lazy to calculate it. <laughs> yeah, I mean maybe it's not really that a difficult line, and I think Anna should see this also pretty quick. I mean 95, 95, bishop e five. Because again, if you don't have this bishop c two idea, Kerry, then the pawn on f seven mm -hmm. is under attack. Let's say rook e three, uh, bishop f seven, and although I can play rook g three. Eight. Yeah, I can also count on knight before even here as a two pawn is hanging, c two pawn is hanging. Um, it's not so dramatic, I guess. No, I think okay, like... maybe maybe not ninety five. So I think Anna is gonna play rook e one, probably pretty quick to protect this pawn, and uh, then she needs to. Oh wait, there's ninety four. Look at this. 94 takes 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 and i take the rook and not with the pawn right and it's still equal i it is still equal but it ke it keeps more pieces on the board right yeah i have a feeling this is going to be a short game that's that's my gut yeah. instinct i, <laughs> I cannot i cannot uh, be uh opposition in this case i also having this kind of feeling because how do you protect it i mean 95 uh black has once again let's check this so 95 95 bishop d5 there's rook a3 and there's the fancy bishop c2 so i mm -hmm. don't think ghana is gonna miss it um the calculation for this level should be pretty basic so the obvious choice is rook e1 and now she is probably evaluating how black is going to defend the pawn on uh, d5 definitely not knight e7 knight b4 by the way is very tempting but the knight on b4 after something like rook d2 might be just pushed mm -hmm. back so it's got to be knight um, is there is there a move let's take a look after knight b4 and rook d2 can black still capture the pawn on c2 and then play knight d3 mm -hmm. the point is that like if you take it back with the rook uh the knight to uh, d3 check and after king d2, you take the rook on e1, and then you take the pawn on e3. And that's very interesting how we can evaluate this position. Mm, indeed. Yeah, that, that is an interesting line. But if I play king f2, how do you stop knight e5? And there's discover check. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. uh, Could be that is unfortunate check. Yeah, <laughs> that is that is coming. I think we should stick with rook d3 here. Oh, yeah. And we might just... Uh, this rook might be, be running out from pieces. Yeah, it might be even something like knight c1. Yeah. I, I might be trapping it somehow. I don't know, maybe maybe bishop f1, you know. I don't see very quickly. So bishop f1. Yeah, I think it's just trapping the rook. Mm -hmm. uh, all yeah. right. Yeah, that's not true. All right. That's not worth the indeed to, to start the match with this kind of end. Um, so rook e1 is the move we are considering here white place a night before night before can be a good move but it needs a calculation as you as you just mentioned it can be just misplaced on before but there could be some quiet move Kathy. for example there could be something like king b8 mm -hmm. you're removing the king and uh, again toy with the idea is that after a3 now the uh, she uses your idea of bishop c to the bar again goes ha 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 what are you doing there mortals <laughs> but you know i mean <laughs> <laughs> this is still interesting it's okay. stuff. I mean, d4, yeah. rook e3, this is very interesting stuff. I would definitely consider this. Yeah, it it's, it really depends what is what is here, both players' motivation, what's the mood. If they want to complicate uh, the game, if you really want to win the first game, then they can, they can totally try. Even though the queens are off the board, this position is still quite rich. Uh, but if they want to just uh, start very slow, or slow and more solid, 
um, they can find a lot of ways to avoid all this kind of complication both sides. All right. And while they're choosing their um, uh, continuations, I do believe the game is looking quite peaceful. We have to go to our very first short break. Dear viewers, hope you're enjoying it so far. Uh, the first game of the semifinals between uh, Anna Muzichuk and Leiting G. This is Keti Tsatsalashvili and I'm Artur Nations. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Take a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or something and don't go anywhere. See you in several minutes. My name is Ethan Curry. Uh, you know, we all have nicknames. Um, Chicago is naturally where I'm born and raised. So that's how I got the name. I guess they call me the muscle. I'm the one with the passion. I'm, a, I'm always looking for a good fight, you know? <laughs> Evidently, it don't make a difference, man. That's checkmate coming up. It don't matter. What we're trying to do is to let them know, hey, we're playing down here in Houston, Texas. And if you come down here, half step and trust me, we're going to beat you. <laughs> You better bring your game. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. This is 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament Pool A, and we have reached to the semifinals. We have Anna Muzicic with White Faces facing Leiting Lee. They are playing in Monaco, and game has just started about one hour ago. We have reached uh, middle game, end game position, and here we are together with Arthur today and tomorrow as well. Uh, before we go back to the game, uh, let's take a look once again at the prize fund and also the prizes that these players are fighting to. Arthur, this is amazing numbers. Wow. I mean, over than 250,000 euros, the total prize fund, the champion gets 60,000 and the runner up 50,000. But all of the participants who made it so far in the candidates tournament are going to be benefit greatly. So again, it's really great to make it to the candidates. Even if you don't win it, there's a very nice prize money waiting for you. Yeah, 20,000 euros for those players who is not anymore running for the tournament that is guaranteed and also for the champion it's not only 60,000 but they also have a chance to get more and more and that's quite attractive indeed we're back right now with the chatboard and we can see that g4 has been played by anna and that took her some time to come up with this idea instead of going root to a1 or take the pawn on d5 she is attacking the bishop on f5, and that puts Lei in the position to come up with the square for this bishop. All right, and again, once we already discussed where the bishop belongs, definitely not on e6 and d7. So remember, it's not about only the pawn on d5. So you might be hesitant to play bishop e6 just to secure your pawn on d5, but the bishop on e6 becomes like a very big giant pawn. So don't do this. So instead, Black should make a very big decision right mm -hmm. now. Do you play bishop e4 or do you play bishop g6? And let's try to figure out what's the big difference here. Yeah, I was actually quite tempted to play bishop e4 here, uh, which kind of forces white to make decision. If you take with a knight, then I get my knight on e4, and that's really good looking piece on in the middle of the board. Right, uh, but here's the thing, Kelly. I'm not so sure that White even has to take on e4. Obviously, there's the fork idea on f2. Mm -hmm. but if I play rook f1, I deal with this f6. And again, there might be ideas like rook f5 immediately attacking the pawn on d5, knight e5, and I'm not so sure that Black is going to be feeling really comfortable because one shot, let's say somewhere on e4, uh, could be even immediately, something like rook d8 and knight c5. You might as well just lose the pawn. Pretty oh, quick. no, we don't want to lose that pawn indeed. So things can get so uh, so ugly so soon here for black. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think actually this uh, bishop e4 is a bit risky choice. I mean, mm -hmm. my gut instinct says that white is going to enjoy a slight advantage because of the bishop. Once again, take it. And even this is pretty much the same. So right. there's some pressure. This is a passive knight. This is an active bishop. So I could take it, or maybe I could play rook f1, rook f4, knight c5, knight e2, combined with g5 ideas. I'm pretty positive that it's bishop g6. It's got to be bishop g6. And I think that uh, she's going to play in a heartbeat. You see, she's ready. She's about to raise the cat. She's double checking the final tricks, final lines. And I'm pretty sure she's going to play bishop g6. Yeah. After bishop g6, now g5 move seems to be the next move we have to consider. As knight to e4 can run into a very interesting line that uh, the uh, the engine suggests here. Bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4, and then rook h to f1. So black has a bit of issue to guard the pawn on f7. And... Uh, uh, how you're going to play. You can play rook d7, you're going to run to knight c5. Um, if you play, right, if you play rook to e7, then uh, you might run to knight e4 here and uh, or knight c5 again. Uh, so the thing is, the thing is that instead of rook e7 here, uh, black might play bishop to g6 
give up the pawn on d5 and when knight takes on d5 then to play rook to e5 and get the pawn back either e3 or g5 this is more like leading g to be honest you know Katie, I look at mm -hmm. this and i wouldn't be surprised that she sees this line because uh, i think that she's a very um uh, dynamic player and right. after g4 bishop g6 uh, she had to see this idea once again a uh, very nice line you mentioned there so g5 uh not e4 is gotta be right you're trying to counterattack the knight you try to go after the fork so bishop e4 would be a very interesting way to keep some tensions why not knight e4 because after knight e4 bishop e4 i think white is just even worse because these pawns become easy targets and uh black has just one weakness on the file while white has potentially another weakness on g5 think about something like rook e5 so it's got to be bishop e4 bishop e4 and now that you said bishop e4 why bishop e4 because after d takes on e4 i think black could be slightly concerned about this bishop on g6 so if white gets the knight on a four mm -hmm. this knight is dominating yeah. the bishop that, that's my feeling right so it's got to yeah. be bishop e4 it's got to be bishop e4. So bishop e4, rook e4, this is pretty much semi-forced line. You have to see this from afar. Rook d7 inst instinctively looks wrong because of knight c5, as you already said. Rook e7 looks weird. But I think bishop g6 is also pretty easy to spot. So the bishop goes back, protects the pawn, opens the rook. So I'm not so sure Anna really has to push g5 here. That's quite a committing it. move. Yeah, it's it's quite... very committing, right? Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but then uh, um, you can you can play also this kind of move, like after knight e4, bishop e4. To me, that's kind of fancy move you play. You give up the bishop right away. And then rook f1, it's something that you put pressure on black, and black has to make a decision to give up the pawn on d5, right? So I might I might think that, yeah, Anna, Anna can play g5 move here. I like what Anna is doing here. You can see that she's clearly concentrating somewhere else. And this is a very famous technique. You take your eyes off the board, but you carry the position with you. So, for example, I don't know, you're probably doing the same. For example, when I'm playing a game, I take the game with me, right? So mm -hmm. I stand up and I walk. I, I make very long walks and I'm thinking about the position in my head, right? It's sometimes a better idea just to remove the board from your eyesight and you're carrying it with you somewhere else. So, for example, Hikaru Nakamura likes to stare at the ceiling. Somebody likes to look left and right. Somebody likes, uh, uh, likes to look in the eyes of the opponent. But you're thinking about the position and there was this very, very nice moment. You could see that Anna is calculating the idea of g5, g5, bishop e4, bishop e4, rook f1. She probably thought, okay, this is not so clear what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do. So this tactic is really, really well known. Yeah, I agree with this, that you don't necessarily need to uh, look at the chessboard. And uh, that was one of the main questions, if that was actually possible, because in the well-known uh, series, T T uh, TV series at uh, Queen's Gambit, uh, <laughs> Beth Harmony. Is it's very often looking at the ceiling and thinking about the position and I love that scene. <laughs> yes. I love that scene. I've, I've seen I've seen the series get it. I love it absolutely. <laughs> it, it shows the the pretty much the idea. Of course, it's really uh a, a bit uh art it's done artistic way of course there's no pieces on the ceiling as beth harman saw right but i love the idea that they're imagining they're calculating it and um, okay maybe yeah that's, a, actually that's the movie the that's the movie movie detail right they have to put the chess board but for the chess players if she just looks at the ceiling we can see why she's looking at the ceiling but for the for the other public they cannot understand why she's watching at the ceiling so that can be a really weird uh situation and with all these uh nice elements of movie elements of course now more or less all the people understand so how just players can can think and i remember that i was getting a lot of questions i don't know probably you too uh if there was actually possible to play chess or to think about the chess position without looking at the board there was um yeah quite a common question and um many yeah, players confirm. have yeah to confirm yeah, yeah, we do yeah. it all the time 
We do it all. Yeah, the time. yeah, and they they still don't believe it when they are trying to like prove you so you to prove some way. How can you prove that? Uh, so, so yeah, um, it's kind of like blindfold chess, right? You don't just don't know what's happening, and I uh, just have all the position in the mind. And what I can uh, say is that when I do think about a position while I'm walking or while I'm uh, drinking uh, some tea, um, some nice ideas can come. And when I'm uh, staring at the board, I'm only calculating the moves that I, all, I know, like the candidate moves. I'm not thinking something different, something extra. And when I'm walking, that's some new ideas come to my mind for some reason, because I'm not focused that much. And right. that's a, yeah, that's very often uh, players are just leaving the board to have these extra possibilities to think of some ideas, but they are surely thinking about the chess all the time. They will not waste any seconds not to think about chess. Yeah, dear viewers, what do you think? How 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 do you think? Is this possible? Are you doing it also yourself? You're staring away somewhere else to gather the thoughts. Uh, I just read a comment, look away from the board to see the board better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. This is what happens. Believe what or happens. not. You know, but, but the big reason why this is happening, because when you're calculating lines and you are looking at the board, you're still seeing the pieces which were captured. And one of the most common mistakes which happens in calculation you include in the calculation the piece which was just captured, you know, which was yeah. maybe captured the first and second move, and you continue to calculate like it's still there, and that's why you just take away the position somewhere else in your mind and you try yeah. to calculate. Absolutely, agree. how many how many games we have we have ruined because of this uh, um, case? What you just mentioned that there was in our calculation the piece on the board but it was actually gone in there in there from the real board so yeah there's a lot of technique and you can work out on it so for for many people probably in our chat so this is still something that's uh not possible to happen but it's it's a way to train i remember when i was kid i was training uh training uh, um to to play bl blindfold and to for the calculation i was training uh without chess pieces on the board actually so that's there are lots of techniques now i don't want to sound very weird so i'm gonna stop in there but uh, a lot of coaches have their own techniques and uh, you guys can also just uh, join the team and try yourself <laughs> too <laughs> right and uh, in the meantime kediana is forcing matters she played g5 you know we didn't really pay any attention was there anything else like rookie one um I'm not sure. I guess Black would play either h6, uh, rely on these tricks uh, to capture on c2, or maybe the same knight e4 was somehow working. We didn't really check it. So knight e4, uh, it doesn't work. Yeah, knight e4, I just take the pawn on d5. Ah, so yeah, that, right. Yeah, so that's a bit interesting. So why not a, maybe h6? Oh, wait, there's rook e5. Look at this move. There's this one, rook e5 and h5 next. Yeah, I do like this idea to challenge the pawn on g4 with h5 indeed. Mm -hmm. Doctors, do we have a move? I think we have g5 on the board as we yeah. can see. Yeah, she's G5. forcing she's forcing matters. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe mm -hmm. she has no choice really because once again, maybe she saw this very nice idea, rook e5, protecting the pawn, threatening h5, going yeah. after the pawn on g4, which might actually become a target. So that's why she played g5, maybe not out of good life, but she's hoping she might get some chances here. But once again, I think we are going to get back to this very critical position after bishop g6. So what happens there? We, we were discussing 95, right? Yeah, we were discussing 95 just briefly. And uh, I don't know after rook e5 what is really happening here. The knight is hanging, uh, pawn on g5 is also hanging, so... And if I play knight f4? I'm not sure which pawn do you take. There's also rook d1, by the way. But okay, for the sake of argument, let's include this one. E yeah, I think I think it's better to take the rook on d1, because in this line, white's rook will remain on open f file, so there might be some rook f7. Yeah, but I'm going to take uh, the king. Ah, that's nice. Yeah, I want to use this rook f7, so very quickly jumping forward with my very big idea here. Oh, so nice. Takes, 
mistakes and some sort of a uh, idea like this. Yeah. It's quite drawish anyway, no? Yeah, kind of, but I think black is quite comfortable here. As right. uh, H pawn will be gone and um you know, you have to we have to come up with very strong idea here for with white like either to push the pawn e4 or bring the king or maybe to play knight d4 to trade a knight. Mm -hmm. Something yeah, like you that. know, Katia, look at this. Uh, this is how most likely the game is going to follow. Definitely not knight h5. Because, I mean, knight h5, you drop the pawn on d5 for no good reason. Uh, the knight on edge of the board is not very good. So it's got to be knight e4. Uh, yeah, bishop e4 is completely ridiculous. So it's got to be knight e4. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait. There could be... No, and bishop e4 seems to me the only move as well as the pawn on g5 is also hanging, like after rook f1 here. But I can either take knight on c3 and double the pawns on c file or just go for knight g5. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to make this work, but of course, this is too much. Yeah, this is definitely too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, relying on this trick of bishop b5, bishop f7, but there's so many weaknesses that white has. Probably not. Yeah, yeah, Kate, I think you're right. Probably bishop e4 is going to follow. Bishop e4. Now, knight e4. Yeah, then black has well, all the fun. Yeah, rook takes e4, the pawn on e3 is hanging. And black is definitely forced to starting to pick up the pawns on uh, from the board. Like, how can you play? If you play rook d3, then this is a quite passive move. You can fall for knight e5, knight b4 moves. If you play rook to f1 to counterattack the pawn on f7, then still 95 is something that I really like here uh, for for black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 95 is also a reasonable move. Maybe bishop g6, maybe 95. The bar says, okay, 95 is slightly worse. Not very obvious why. What if I... Oh, wait, we sort of discussed this idea at some point. Take, yeah. take, take, and 95 next. So yeah. you might have some problems. Takes. Some problems, although it still looks um, between uh, equal and slightly better for white. So I wouldn't really say that black is in a lot of trouble, but he loses the pawn. Something like knight f3, I think, just to go after g5 pawn. Ooh. So if you play knight b7, then king c7 gets some tem tempo there. If knight f4, this... Uh... Can we just save the knight and then, yeah, something like that. Maybe knight h4 or something, knight h4. That is, uh, this knight is a mourner. Yeah, I heard it somewhere. Yeah, it's not really doing anything. It's pretty bad. Yeah. In, okay, in okay, this is probably Spanish, not Spanish. Really in Spanish language, they are calling this kind of knights donkeys. So that's like kind of donkey kind of. No, not not a, not a very good one. Yeah, so it's got to be 94. Takes, takes. Okay, how far can we call like this? Let's say rook of one. So 95, I think black is sort of risking. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, we could we could argue about that, of course. But let's say bishop g6. It suits the playing style of leading g, being the aggressive player. Uh, stack the pot on d5. But, ah, wait, I could take with the... Ah, if you take with the rook... You take on e3, and then your yeah, pawns are weak. Yeah, this is this is getting somewhere not very pleasant for white indeed, because too many too many things are getting off the board, and then you're gonna have a lot of weaknesses. And black's pawn structure looks quite nice here. Right. So ninety five. It's gotta be ninety five. Yeah. Yeah, ninety five. Rookie five. Knight f four. Okay, maybe rook d1 to this launch the rook. I'm still going to take with the king. Rook g5. I got to take on g6. Black most likely is going to take. Okay, I could play for some activity with rook f7 maybe. I could keep the king cut off. But this is not right. very clear. You know, Kelly, I, I look at this. It's not very clear from the wise perspective. Is this really so great? Because... From the Black's perspective, I see the very easy plan, rook h5, rook h3, and roll forward my pawns. 
Yeah, that's 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 what I was also thinking. But now after watching it, this uh, rook f7 move without check, I like it more for white because, like for instance, let's take the pawn on g7. A rook takes the h3 pawn, and now you have this knight c5 move, which goes after b7 pawn. A knight and the rook together can be a really really good team against the passive king. So right. that can be the right approach for for white. Yeah, this looks very interesting. A knight e6, this is a problem, this is a target, king e2. So, I mean, maybe the entire line even doesn't work. But I see visually, Kerry, that white has better pieces. The rook on g7 is very active. The knight on e6 is annoying. White has a passer at the e-file. Well, these pawns, they're going to be crawling forward like a turtle, really. I mean, think about something like rook h5, h6, g5, rook h4, g4, h5, rook h3, g3, h4, etc. Super slow. It is super slow indeed, and we have the move on the board. What is that? Knight g4? Yeah, knight g4. Uh, well, yeah, that was kind of something that we would expect here, because otherwise, like, knight h5, knight e7 would just drop the pawn on d5. And now let's see what Anna can respond. She already knows her next move, I'm sure. She's just rechecking it again. Uh, and it's another technique that most of the players are using the opponent's time. So they are thinking on opponent's time and that's how they are keeping it. Yeah. There we go. Bishop takes on e4. Uh, did you see that stare, Kitty? I mean, uh, there's mm -hmm. one thing I I sometimes feel uncomfortable when the opponent is psychologically so strong that he mm -hmm. stares in your eyes. It's like sending a message. And from time to time, Anna is like, having this stare yeah. at the opponent, right? I'm sending the message. I'm all about business <laughs> here. I mean, try to gather some information. It's really, really yeah. amazing. Yeah. And that, in that case, you would you should never play against Garia Chikina because I think she has the toughest look at the opponents. Really, it is. Uh, and we have so many photographs captured that moment. And we can also see on the coverage that uh, she likes to stare at the opponent in a way, you know, and that, that's actually scary looking. I would never wish to be her opponent. Um, but sometimes, um, you know what happens when you play moves like this bishop before, and it's not something that you play every day and to give up the bishop for it for the night is not it's we're not doing it unless we have something planned then you want to know your opponent's reaction so it can be either to send a signal or just understand what's your opponent's face yeah you can you can see if it's unpleasant move for your opponent you can be more confident yeah indeed indeed yeah so uh, it's a lot of psychology a lot of psychology of course and uh yeah uh, Anna, Anna is really definitely trying to, trying to do this, and uh, maybe you know the character of the game, Kerry, is slightly changing because it yeah. did feel that this game is sort of peaceful. But I think Anna is already very committed. So she played g4, g5. She took the bishop mm -hmm. on e4. The pressure on the pawn on d5 still remains. And rook f1, I'm absolutely certain this is going to follow, not knight e4, because knight e4 would be a big disappointment. And she's just checking. I think she's just checking right now this line. So rook f1, bishop g6, uh, knight e5. As a really well-educated person, she has to check all of the candidate moves so it's not only yeah. rook e5 it's not only rook e5 there's other moves as well you have to check maybe you have to mm -hmm. check ideas like wait can i where's this cheating can i do this Oof, that is crazy move really <laughs> we had this idea before no yeah but um how can we play here with white? I have no idea. The thing is, like, for instance, like after taking the rook, the, the pawn on f7 is hanging. That's my ah, concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was so relying on my big fork here, but maybe it's nothing. Take rook f Okay, definitely white is better. Yeah, very active rook. Mm, yeah, it's like no problem for white. And I think if it's only one player who wins here who can win the game and it's definitely white i don't see any counterplay here for black you're right but the idea is fancy i like it i like it you're right so i mean Anna also has to check this right maybe there's some tricks uh maybe black and yeah rook of one is on the board by the way but after 95 she has to check maybe black has some other move 
So you're, according to the calculation theory, you have to check all of the forcing moves. And I'm pretty sure there's more than one. There could be, could be something like bishop page five intermezzo move. This is a typical classical forcing move. So bishop page five, you attack the rook, rook goes, I don't know where, rook d2, and then you play rook e5, and you try to work out the differences. Yeah, yeah, the difference uh, here might be that bishop on h5 is not guarded by the pawns, it's guarded by the rook, but this might be something even better for, for white, and that's why it still needs calculation. For us, it's quite easy to make the moves because we can always take it back, and who will judge us for that? But for players, they cannot take moves back at all, and they have actually enough time for this position. I don't I don't really expect here any time uh, time problems for any of the players. Yeah, uh, the, the rate they're playing, um, this appears to be a non -issue, not an issue in this game mm -hmm. because uh, they are having 90 minutes for the first 40 moves, then they get extra 30 minutes, plus of course 30 seconds being made. So Bishop G6, uh, I'm pretty sure has to be played. Uh, Rook D7, big no-no. Rook E7 maybe is also a choice, which is slightly passive, but I think uh, the answer is pretty obvious here. Uh, the way Letting G plays, Bishop G6 should be a pretty easy choice. Yep, waiting for the moves uh, from her. And I kind of have a feeling that she's about to play a move, but she's also double checking it. Uh, very interesting. Earlier there was some, uh, we had this topic of uh, Staring at the openings, and our mod moderator suggesting to wear uh, glasses, sunglasses <laughs> at the gesture note. There was one Green Master who was wearing sunglasses. Arthur, can you? Was it Hikaru you... who was reflecting the negative energy of Magnus? Really? No. Was it Hikaru? Too? I don't know. I mean, he was wearing it at some point, he was distracted by the stare. I think it was mm -hmm. Hikaru, actually. Okay, maybe. I don't remember it correctly, but I think that one of the common excuses that why the men players sometimes are wearing sunglasses, they are hiding the fallout from the yesterday. <laughs> this yeah. is what I've seen, really. So uh, other reason, it's not like in poker, right? I mean, in poker, actually, you know, those reflective sunglasses, they're really cool. Yeah. Because your eyes tell everything. I mean, you look at the opponent's eyes and you read everything. And in poker, of course, you yeah. need to, you need to not to show how you're feeling about your cards. But in chess, I mean, everything is wide open. So there's no need, no need to hide the emotions. Uh, <laughs> At least the way yeah, but it's still complicated. Yeah, I, I the person that I had in my mind is Badr Jabawa, who I think our our viewers know quite well, as he's also one of the streamers and uh, well-known streamers, and he has quite a character, um, not only in chess. Uh, so he used to play with sunglasses for for. Uh, two or three tournaments i think that he lost his sunglasses and he was very upset with that and there was a lot of speculations why he was using it was that sponsor and so on and so on and i was so curious i asked like why are you using sunglasses and he, the answer was like i just like it <laughs> and yeah. I'm like really <laughs> yeah there was yeah he just liked it and he was actually it was lucky glasses for him as i understood oh. Yeah, the lucky, lucky elements, of course. As I've talked with a lot of people. They are really, uh, uh, what's the right word for that? Um, believe in uh, things and lucky things like the lucky pen, the lucky shirt, the way you write yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Super, superstition, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah just players are known, known for that. Bishop G6 is on the board. I would love to know if they, if these girls, uh, the participants, already we have two uh, participants, but if they have anything superstitious. I have someone actually with me here who was... <laughs> It just happened that I have it here. The, this was my lucky teddy bear that I was always taking with me at the youth competitions. And for some reason, I still have it with me. So <laughs> I wow. think, yeah, all the chess players have something. Does it have a name? Yeah, Blue is the name. Blue? Oh. You might ask why, but <laughs> it's, it's obvious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. All right. I usually have a lucky pen. But anyway, I mean, looking, going back to the game, Bishop G6 is played, uh, which uh, 
should have been expected by Anna, mm -hmm. uh, 95? Or what else? Yeah, 95 would give also all these other moves could could give some possibilities because then knight c5 could happen. Knight d5 has happened rather fast here because then what else you can play? Yeah, the pawn on e3 is hanging. So I think Ghana can be just fine to go to this end game and just call it all a right. day. Here we go again. So rook e5. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I have to play knight f4. Yeah. I could maybe be tricky with but something like c4, keep the knight in the center, but the bishop on g6 is very strong. No, I think we want to somehow use this idea for f7, right? Uh the thing is that after c4, you're um uh, letting black to have this long diagonal for the bishop, and there can be at some point some very unpleasant checks for to king, and it can end really badly. Like for the moment, it's not working. Knight b4, knight a2, it's not even a checkmate. But there can be an also b5 right away. It just looks something something extra that it's not really possible to yeah. uh, lead you in some nice continuation. We have a move, I believe, and rook e5 is on the board. So far, we have predicted pretty much most of the moves uh, because it's an mm -hmm. incredibly logical game. Uh, I think knight f4 should follow. The only thing here, I'm not totally sure what black should do with the rook. So I'm pretty positive that uh, leading g is going to spend uh, something like five minutes at least. Unless she has already decided, should she include a trade or not? Because, for example, maybe she wants to keep the rook on d8. And why? Because after knight g6, oh, let me just take the pawn first. Knight g6, f takes, rook f7, black keeps an option to capture on the 8 with the knight. And the okay. knight now protects a lot of critical squares, like the pawn on b7, the, the square on e6 against invader knight, something like this. And maybe this is actually the safe way to play. Because rook d1, king d1, I'm not so sure, is this actually good for black? Yeah, this is maybe some useful detail for Black to have this knight on the uh, on the seventh square. First of all, it attacks, attacks the rook, also guards the pawn on p7, um, and to have king on d1, this might not be even even any better for Black because it's closer to e3 pawn. So um, yeah, I kind of like this more, uh, but then White can can keep the both rooks on the board. So for instance, just to take the pawn on g7 and then to play rook to f1 and rook f7, something like that to look for some like counterplay. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's imagine this from the Black's perspective. So this is a match mm -hmm. situation. The end game, for example, this, what was it? Rook d1, king d1, rook g5, knight g6, uh, whatever. Rook g6 or f takes, I have no idea. So let's say, it's difficult to value this. I'll tell you honestly, I don't know how to value this. I look at this, I see this, but the most difficult part is to give the proper assessment and mm -hmm. understand, can I go here or maybe I'm just entering a lost endgame. So I'm looking here, is there a way how to liquidate? Now, this is one of the most popular terms at the professional circuit. You're looking for ways to liquidate this game into a draw. And I think that... Uh, this has to be in Leiting G's mind, right? Okay, of course, she can try to enter this position with all three results possible, but maybe she can get, she can try to get rid of all of the pawns very quick. So, for example, let's say rook g5, can I try to liquidate this with take, take, rook f7, and now mm -hmm. try to get rid of these pawns as quickly as possible. Don't rely on yeah. my passers. Just liquidate these pawns. Can I do it? I think that's... Uh... That's quite interesting uh, moves, yeah, there, and it's very possible to happen. Mm -hmm. Like this, maybe? And like this. Takes. And I'm ready to trade the spawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually thinking knight c5, like when we had off the rooks off the board. So I think knight c5 is still here. Mm -hmm. Go after b7 pawn, and now it pretty much depends. Like, if you play b6 again, then 96, uh, and we kind of go to the same position. Um, 
-hmm. what else can you play? I could take on e3. I'm not so sure I should do it because it gives white some options to snatch the pot on b7 and then we enter some sort of a race and i think in general the players are a bit afraid they're a bit afraid to enter a race right unless they have no choice they have to try to play for the win because you might as well just lose it right so you have mm -hmm. a race one a pawn majority at the queen side your opponent has two connected pawns at the king side you miss one moment that's it so normally yeah. practical it's a good idea to avoid the race unless you can very clearly calculate what's happening there and these two players clearly know what can be the uh, consequences of that too risky game as Anna was the one who was fighting so hard to stay in the match and tie the match as she lost the first round and Lei won the first game against Maria Muzuchuk and she also knows how big advantage is that. So yeah, this opponent game, the engine says it's like just a slightly better for Black, but um, I think it's just more than slightly better here. Mm, yeah, two because pass pawn, king. there's just one pass pawn and black has two for the yeah. moment. So you need to organize two connected pass pawns. So this is just a sample line, really. I, I made it up, uh, but it makes sense. So we do have a move, one. rook d1. They decided to trade the rooks uh, and to go to the to that position next actually we had a comment um, about like after knight f4 to take the pawn on e3 and i think that's also a possibility to take e3 first and then to take uh h3 so now we have to make choice between g5 pawn and e3 pawn oh yeah by point. the way by the way perfect perfect uh, question but uh, then again you don't eliminate the pawn on g5 for example i take on mm -hmm. g6 you play f takes on g6 and I could play rook f7. I guess I want to keep your king cut off. So if you play something like this, this endgame is always slightly worse for black. I mean, my two pawns are holding your three pawns. Uh, any endgame, I don't care what the bar is saying. This is just not very, uh, not very practical way to go here. So this is not going to happen, and black is going to try to liquidate. But is this so clear? Maybe it is actually. And now, now not c5 again. Yeah, this but I just, that. I just take it. And uh, okay, the bar, of course. Oh, I, whoa, whoa, what's whoa, happening here? I missed something. Oh, I missed the fork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I missed a little fork. I was. And this kind of uh, blunders is so possible to happen when you're calculating from the distance, right? Uh, yeah, like it is. You have to. I was only concentrating on this, knight b7, rook d5, and I want to trap this knight. Now, this is yeah. my big idea. Somehow, I'm trapping it. I have no idea how, really. But, uh, yeah, uh, somehow this tactically works. So maybe rook e3, once again, knight g6, f takes. I want to cut off the king. So probably take, probably take, what was it? Rook h5, knight c5. Okay, this is a big mistake, by the way. Rook g5, rook g8. And if right. I play something quiet, like 98, it's like a passive, but it's scary, you know, Kitty, what do you think for black? Uh, it seems to be worse for me with this G5 pawn uh, for white, because like if you want to take my G5 pawn, then you have to at least give me the H7 pawn. And then with just one pawn, white can easily handle it. Like King E2, King F2, that's it. Um, so to me this pawn on g5 looks more active and more dangerous for white rather than the pawn only three was in all those lines so that can be just a small difference maybe not too much uh, but um, white's pieces look way more active in that sense so i really expect here rook g5 instead absolutely agree yeah i think i think you're right so the pawn on g5 is a bit more far at once so black cannot easily liquidate with rook e3 um Unless she's looking for something else, rook g5 is probably the move. Something like bishop e4, keep the bishop alive. I think this is slightly too much. So she takes on g5. Yeah, yeah she g5. takes on g5. And here we have it. Yeah, well, the, earlier they also there was a comment. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dead draw. I don't think it's still a dead draw because we can see a little bit of some 
a misplay from any of the colors. We, we don't even know who is better here because no one is better. So, uh, and uh, when knights are still on the board in the end game, they're tricky pieces and we might see some forks uh, as well happening. So it's not that draw, it's just equal position. And I'm sure players gonna play until until the very end and uh, they will just keep the eyes on all these kind of possibilities and after even those kind of positions with nine night and game with a slightly better you can convert that you can absolutely convert that yeah yeah absolutely and i also agree this is not a dead draw the position is rather unusual unless of course the players are going to find a way how to trade these pawns very quick mm -hmm. um so the next moves are going to be really important by the way Kerry, you know i'm looking at this position and i'm not entirely sure that 9g6 even is a mandatory move because of course it it, it comes with the idea to play uh, 9g6 rook f7 knight c5 etc but i think that also anna should have a pretty good suspicion that there might be just nothing and <laughs> it is probably a result for a play for the three results so what if we keep the knight on a four limiting the the bishop on g6 and seek something else something like knight d4 is this a move yeah i also like h4 move there after you just say that we don't really need to rush yeah into the decisions although anna just decided to capture this but kind of like h4 move here and ask the opponent like okay just find the correct move here mm -hmm. Right, so knight g6 was played, ftx on g6 was played, so we saw this position already quite some time ago. Um, yeah, now do you give a check on a fate or you don't? That is a big question. Yeah, that's the big I would go personally not to give a check and cut the king from the seventh rank uh, and just be happy to capture the pawn uh, move later than to capture it right away. Yeah, but here's the thing. I mean, if you give a check, I play, well, let's discard 98 for the moment. Let's say I play king c7, mm -hmm. you play rook f7 check, and the black plays king c8, we just win a tempo, right? No, 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 king b6, right? Yeah, that's, to, a, to have... that's an issue. Yeah. And also the second also issue kind of... is this. Yes. 97 and Arthur's the, 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 the besides the fact that the king is cutted on the back rank, also knight can be limited. Uh, on b3 because king b6 for black that means that knight can go on c5 square mm -hmm. so although i found some ideas play. already with 96 on my forks again yeah by the way <laughs> once again let's check this so check here check here i do i actually take it maybe i don't need this pawn at all uh, yeah, but what else to play though here? <laughs> That's a very valid question. Maybe bring this knight in the game. Ninety two, ninety four. Kind of running out from the from the pieces, yeah. Okay, okay. Let's include this. So, what does it change? I'm not so sure. And now I play here. Yeah, I just take the pawn on h three, and after check, I activate my king on c five. Yeah, not very clear, is it? Yeah not very clear at all so yeah you're right i think at a rook f7 has got to be the way and uh anna right. is somewhere <clears throat> deep in the thoughts after rook g7 rook h3 uh the bar likes it actually look at this getting 0 0.62 what's the reason for it <laughs> 0 0.62 advantage for white the largest white is that knight c5 or what is that I have no idea i don't know i just got the bar must be knight c5 no yeah no, knight c5 like is, yeah knight c5 no not knight c5 for key mm. three okay what if we keep the pawn in place something like king e2 yeah king e2 i think we can give a check <laughs> you check and we have problems here yeah it's a very good check yeah if you play king d3 the night before we'll get another pawn on a2 or c2 um it doesn't look very good for white <laughs> no no no, it doesn't. Okay, so what are I supposed to play here? Where's this advantage once again? Here, here, take, here. What's what's the move here? Uh, 
There's no move. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't see anything. To be honest, King D2, King no. D2 is a check, right? So knight c5 is rook e3. And again, we sort of looked at this. Actually, mm -hmm. white can get worse very quick. Slightly worse. E yeah, I'm just checking. I'm just checking some moves that the engine gives the advantage. But then when you make the move, it chains right away. So I think uh, here it's not big of issue uh, for black, and it will be just change. All the only thing what I can see here, like after rook f7, black can play rook to g3 to complicate a situation a little bit more because now we have like both pawns hanging, but. When rook takes on g7, now clearly you have to take h3 pawn. Yeah. To protect the pawn on h3 and then everything liquidates, right? Yeah. I also also see nothing here. So let's say it could be something like knight e4. Uh, yeah, maybe this is, by the way, the way. Knight e4. I'm going to take on e3. Knight c6. B takes. I guess this is risky once again for white. Because mm -hmm. there's something like rook h3. Yeah, to keep these two connected pass pawns for, for the opponent, they can roll together. And this is a dead draw, uh, even without this pawn. Yeah, I, I think this yeah. is a dead draw. Three pawns against two at the king side. Even if white heroically wins the pawn and plays for a couple of moves. Now, this is looking like a draw. Yeah, agree, agree with that. White is uh, thinking she has 48 minutes, but this is the position that you can even play this with the few minutes on the clock as as we have seen all these lines seems to be pretty equal although white pawns are more like uh damaged and we're very often mentioning about the islands pawn islands and white has three of them but white can have very active rook and in the end game to have an active rook that's that's almost a half point so rook f7 or rook f8 it's really up to the uh calculation that Anna is doing now that can lead us into some kind of more traits of the pawn and then in the end game even even if one of the player finds herself without a pawn it can be drawish still yeah but um they they have to play at least until move 40 even if this is looking quite equalish uh mm -hmm. not a tragedy for anna i mean okay this is a match situation she tried something she was surprised um opponent find all the right moves so okay whatever draw is good right so i think actually this is also the attitude of many professional chess players you do your best uh the opponent mm -hmm. solves all the problems okay fine yeah so be it right it's maybe not ideal for your match strategy but okay i mean draw is a draw it's still a result it could have been worse and actually to remind you the viewers the what was it the quarterfinal of the candidates match uh of anna muzichuk when she was playing against conor humpy she started with a loss so there's that she definitely yeah, knows right. the importance of the first game yeah that's right and also uh indeed anna had not enough time uh to not as much time as Lei had between the uh, matches she just had yesterday one free day and obviously she used that for preparation while Lei had two days because she did not go for the tie breaks she won the match against Maria without the tie breaks uh, and that in this kind of events can be quite quite a thing you know you don't need to you don't want to be exhausted and all these games are so long and uh, even the fact that it, they are playing for bigger price than usually the tournaments are having, it's it's in the end of the day they are playing for the title, right? They can have each of them can have right to be challengers, and that's the dream of all the players to be the world champion. So all this tension, all these emotions comes to you, and uh, you definitely need more free days to process and understand what's really going on and also more time to uh, for the preparation others uh, the the day that we covered the tie breaks in rapid it was clearly visible that anna was so well prepared for the tie breaks um she was changing the openings all the time and she was getting very good position a very sharp position and she was the one who was 
was pushing very much. Mm-hmm. So Th- this, is, yeah. this should be also part of the preparation because once again, you probably expect that at least one of your match, if everything is going to be going fine, uh, mm-hmm. is going to uh, make it to the tie break. So you need to have some sort of a strategy. Tie breaks have entirely different uh, strategy. You're playing maybe slightly offbeat continuation so that your opponent is not really ready. So, okay, let's not talk about that too much here. But you know, Kerry, what you mentioned is that this uh, tiredness of playing uh, the classical games and then you have a tie break. The one thing which comes to my mind is the World Cup, obviously. And I think there it's extremely important to have not the tie breaks because I think the format normally in the World Cup, FIDA World Cup, is that you play the first game, yeah. second game, tie breaks, next round immediately. First game, second round, tie breaks, next game immediately. And you play it non-stop, non-stop. And when you qualify, 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 <laughs> Uh, you play all the tie breaks, you're just exhausted, right? And uh, maybe yeah. here it's not so visible, but when you play a longer run, oh my goodness. Yeah, so that's why I never choose to play at the World Cup because I don't want to stress out myself. <laughs> well, you can always quit after the round one. I don't know. I mean, it's just I'm going up, home. Right? <laughs> right. No, guys, it's quite, quite hard to get at the World Cup. There are some tournaments you can qualify to, but it is super, super, super hard. And at that point, when you are uh, the qualifier of the World Cup, you are you have been through many tournaments, and um, yeah, you are kind of getting used to it. But yeah, I agree. I agree with this kind of event, which has qualifiers, is most exhausting for players, and also uh, for many players, uh, they have said that it's very. Uh, Mm, exhausting that's uh they don't know when to go back they don't have tickets they don't know how long the hotel will be booked so when they lose the match they have to lose the same day or sometimes the next day and that is something some details that uh, all of us worry the traveling uh, details um luckily for this tour um participants here they can stay uh, after the game as we know um, Maria is staying also Connor is staying here so that's quite good conditions for those hmm. that's the, that's a difference from World Cup usually yeah I imagine also in Monaco right I mean really such a, lux- a luxurious place to be so um, yeah and then now you can see Anna is a bit smiling there I don't know what, what she found there no no reason to be unhappy maybe you found a funny line sometimes it's quite interesting yeah. you look at the opponent uh, i mean look at the players uh facial expressions and sometimes they're, they're funny uh, they notice some things so they uh, find it amusing like i've seen several times magnus carlson is smiling or laughing about something you, can, you never <laughs> really know <laughs> um y- yeah 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 uh there was actually uh, uh quite common thing uh, of Mario Muzicic because we played the uh, same US Championship several times and uh, she was always um, well she was calculating the positions she was just smiling and there was the moment we knew that something was wrong for us because she was seeing probably good line as a kid we thought so um, yeah and another another thing that uh, would I have um observed here about Anna is that uh, at, the, at the start of the, uh, the tournament, she was very focused, like super focused. Um, and then I saw her smiling when she won the last game uh, of classical chess. And then the next game when she won the tie breaks, she was extremely happy. And that's the Anna we know usually. And now today we can see on video, she's back to this focus mode and she's uh, trying to be fully dedicated to chess are you sure she can't hear you because you're there in monaco i am four floors away from her so i believe i I once got it i mean i was doing a commentary of there was this acp tour some kind of a commentary in riga and they were playing on the first floor and and we're doing the commentary for i don't know also four floors something like that and then somebody said they could actually hear some of the (laughs) some of the commentary in the playing (laughs) range it was pretty funny right so you don't know maybe anna is just enjoying what you said about her no uh no <laughs> i i'm sure they cannot they cannot hear me i'm sure with that but i also had the same same situation at the women's grand prix 
um, there were players just looking around, looking in cameras, and they were just struggling to. And we could see on the face, we could we couldn't hear, but we could see. And as a joke, we I just said like, wait, can they hear us or what's going on? And in fact, they could hear us as uh, as uh, one of the person production just uh, uh, left the voices on top and then he left the room so imagine kathy the opponent plays something and he goes oh my goodness and all of the monaco hears it right so maybe this yeah, is actually fired next day. oh my goodness what a blunder and then i was like what what what's that there's an echo yeah. coming from something okay i'm just kidding of course i i do believe that they're not hearing you yeah actually you know as we have a little bit more time let's uh let's uh have some time for chat and uh, as chat can ask any questions to us uh and we will try to for sure respond if we can <laughs> and uh, yeah guys if you're curious about anything we can uh, surely surely answer so let's use this moment as anna is taking her time and thinking her next move and we can choose one or two questions from the uh, from the from our viewers yeah by the way so, one yeah. thing one thing i hadn't mentioned is that i have the chat open so thanks for all of your nice messages and, and questions and funny remarks i do read all of them so uh <laughs> we we really care uh literally care what you have to say and uh yeah <laughs> it depends we care if it's nice no, comments if it's not we nice care. we don't care <laughs> no, no no we literally care yeah so uh um um sh uh, shoot it yeah get it out because i don't think there's going to be some major developments in this game anytime soon <laughs> we're having uh, we're having a lot uh, of questions we're having a lot of questions i i don't um uh, okay the favorite food the favorite food arthur's let's go what's your favorite food <laughs> I, I I have no such favorite food. I don't know. I just I just eat what I eat. I try to eat good food, healthy food. So, uh, um, what about you, Kitty? Um, I love sushi. In fact, today I'm planning to 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 go for for that. Uh, sushi is in my mind all day, so I will really? go with that today. Wow. Yes, today. All right. What is? There are some questions we have to skip, I guess. <laughs> Because it's open questions, but is there anything you would like to read it out? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. How do you prepare for a commentary session? Oh, this is a ritual. Mm. This is the entire ritual. So, of course, we check. There we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we check everything, what <laughs> they have played before. We open chess space, we draw charts, we gather information, we write it down. I have it here written all of it and i had prepared a very nice story for you to talk about the petrov you know I, I was gonna talk about petrov for hours i was gonna talk about uh, petrov what they played in this uh candidate yeah. what they played before who played petrov before petrov this petrov that and then and then leiting she just destroyed all of my material in the first move she played the uh, c5 really but I, I i really like it i i think it was a great choice but um yeah, we do prepare. Yeah. What, what about you, Kitty? How do I prepare? It really depends what kind of tournament. If it's a closed tournament and I know the participants and I know that I'm going to co commentate, of course, I'm just trying to do it in some time advance. But usually I always have my notebook with me uh, and I take it. Uh, I, I put the notes in here at one place because like uh, sometimes we have the tournaments that we have the same participants. It's And all the stories are here, like saved in here. And if something like i want to remember and it's like okay how was that and that day and if i can understand what i'm what is written there i can recall it and use it so usually i do almost the same i like to check the statistics first of all to understand who is the favorite um then i like to know what's like each player what kind of style they have and i'm checking their games uh and uh 
uh, then some kind of like interesting information. Uh, uh, f for me, I know many, many of these players, but for instance, Ting Linji is someone that I just saw recently. She's a very open person. She is someone that it's very pleasant to have chat. Uh, but I still don't know much of about her. She is not having social media, at least that I'm aware of. And there's not too much also in uh, in, in the internet. So uh, if there is a player that I know some interesting facts, I just love that um, to to have for for the stream. And then it starts my makeup session. <laughs> so another part. This is this is where I don't do anything at all. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Obviously. Yes. So yeah, that takes that takes some time. All right. All right. So, by the way, while we were uh, saying talking about our preparations, one move was played, rook f7. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, to keep the king cut off, it makes perfect sense. So, I'd actually, you know, Katie, now that I look at this position, I noticed one more option, which we didn't really discuss, which is also rook d5 check, king e2, and rook d7. So, on top okay. of everything else, you also have to consider this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's, uh, seems uh, another option here when we see the bar just went a little bit up out there. And this can be the reason because you can trade these rooks and play knight c5 and then knight c6 and you're losing the pawn on g7 and probably you don't want to give up this pawn for free. Yeah, but it's actually it's tricky after king d7. You don't take the pawn here because this no. knight is now... A mourner, right? I, I learned this by from Jeffrey Zhang. Uh, he he said it's a mourner. Uh, so okay, after it's knight, what? a mourner. Uh, there. I mean, you, ah. have to ask, you have to ask him the details. <laughs> I, I I just like it. I just like what he said. It, it's really okay. nice. It's just a sad night. I, usually, I say it's a sad night. Uh, that that's what I say. He yeah, had a different level completely. Uh, so. Yeah, so Black here loses the pawn quite unexpectedly to fork Knight of Fate, so probably it's not going to happen. I mean, you have to you have to check this idea of Rook D5, Rook D7, but I think that uh, Black is not going to miss this idea of Knight C5, Knight E6, and now she's just uh, trying to work out these very small details like Rook H5, Rook H3, or Rook G3, Rook H3, and she has all the time in the world to do just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually like we have three candidate moves, right? So rook h5 looks to me to be the main one. Mm -hmm. Then is also rook to g3, and we also saw rook d5. So pretty much it's rook move. Yeah, it's pretty logical. Uh, also, there could be some checks <laughs> if you have one even more about... moves. Yeah, how about knight b4 here to go after a2 pawn? Perfectly logical move. By the way, it comes with some check ideas as well. Yeah. So I think, again, from the black's perspective, uh, it's quite important for leading G to understand what does she want? What, what do you want from this game? Do you want to liquidate into a draw? Because when you mm -hmm. decide, I want to liquidate this into a draw because this is a match strategy, this is the first game, etc., you play accordingly. Or do you want to go for a a three result game? What do you want? Yeah. So that's what she needs to figure out here. It is true, but also like this is the first game out of four, and usually you you, you know in the last day what you really need, not to, not not what you want, but what you need. You either needs you are either in must win situation or draw is also okay. But for the first game, that's a bit tricky, right? And maybe they just uh, give a try, just just start the the game, and they make decision on the board. Do you think that they are making decision on the board, or they have some kind of strategy before the game? No, probably should have some strategy. I, I think so. Most of the players have, uh, especially in the matches. But uh, by the way, that's by the way, an interesting question, Kelly, because sometimes something happens. For example, let's say you play from the Blacks' perspective and you decide before the game, okay, I'm going to be the solid player. I'm going to try to play for the draw, you know, not to take any risks. And suddenly you have this chance to win the game. And it's difficult. It's very yeah. difficult to break this mindset because you have already decided that you are going to make the draw. And it's very often, before, uh, 
uh, that you miss these chances, right? That you miss these chances. Yeah, you yeah, misplay yeah. because your mind is that I have to make a draw. So really tricky thing. Yeah, that's uh, you have to be very practical, right? And also just be open-minded and make the decision. Uh, there is another co question in the chat. Are there the snacks behind them for bucket of the snacks? I can prove approve that that's a snacks there. And just to describe the whole uh, the playing venue there, because we mostly see the 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 side of the venue where the players are but there there is a behind of of, of this you guys you can see that all those windows and the cartoons there is the garden uh which uh the players can use and they can go outside if they need to relax a bit um and they on the way they do have these snacks they have some kind of nuts or fruits uh or some kind of biscuit i think also some energy bars and the other side they have tea coffee and uh, also many kind of juice together with the water so it's pretty much everything there and um it's also so silent, Arthur. I was there a couple of times at the beginning, and I just wanted to to have a glass of water, and it created so much noise. I was like, okay. <laughs> imagine, <laughs> imagine, Kathy comes silently, watches the players, yeah. and just pours the water. <laughs> it's yeah. like, what, yeah, what's the big noise yeah. there? Yeah. I I actually, uh, it it was not just the water. Actually, I I saw it. I will not name what I saw, what kind of drink I saw. It's like, okay, oh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it. And I started to get, it and I just realized that the players started to look at the side, and I was like, okay, should I leave this in the middle, or should I just take it and walk away and never come back? So that's like really a nice, um, nice atmosphere. Not to like sometimes they're like not nice conditions because uh, it's you know many people there for some player it can be too cold so for some player it can be too hot so uh what i have seen so far it is just pleasant for everyone well i definitely hope that uh, monaco is going to host more tournaments i know that usually uh they are organizing this women's team for european mm -hmm. club cup i don't know much about the other wins there used to be this very prestigious prestigious amber blindfold and rapid uh, yes. uh, this uh, two tournament uh, combination now unfortunately it's finished and uh, now what you described to play in such an amazing place with so good conditions for me <laughs> coffee snacks oh my goodness sign me up everything together yes it's yeah. great it's really really great Arthur's, uh there is actually more and more stories I can I can tell you but they're playing rather really fast here Rook G1 has been played and Anna responded with King D2 and another check and maybe this is the moment when they will repeat the moves do you think um, that they will go for a draw here so you're saying this is it this is it this is a draw I don't know wait how was this actually <laughs> it was pretty forced right so Rook G1 check King D2 Rook G2 check King D1 why not King E2 What's the problem of King E2? I guess you give a check. You don't want mm -hmm. to drop the spawn. Rook F2 takes, takes, and Knight B4, is it? I think Knight B4, C3, though. You can play C3 yeah, here. Yeah, but there's a fork on D3. Oh, I did not see that. And what if I play oh, yes. Knight B4? Knight takes A2, and then C3 three no i'm fine oh you want to trap the knight of course yeah it's very logical but i think but I already made up the one. she already had made up the mind you, you could see how quickly she played we we missed the sequence we mentioned that there might be some checks at some point i didn't realize that white can't really avoid just a second once again here here boom 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 knight before yeah wait wait get it what about this move? And if I take, you play King E2, and my knight will be lost in two moves if I don't do something. How about A5 here? A4. And we have a mourner again. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. On A1. The only move, but oh wait, there might be B6 as well. Now B6 doesn't change a thing. I take on A4. Oh come on, this is not very human. Not very human at all. Wait. But why is she then repeating the position? So, King E2, 
What was, what was it once again? So, OG2. Take. Okay, maybe black is not obliged to do this. But, um, uh, instead of instead of taking on F2, black can play rook to G3, go after each three pawn, and you have to play rook to F3, and then I play rook G2 again, right? Yeah, but I might just uh, go back to these ideas of uh, rook F8, rook F7. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, just a second. What about this one? What about the same game of knight e5? How do you evaluate this? So we have two pass pawns here, potentially. Black has something here. The bar uh, locks it for black. Slightly better. Maybe this? Yeah, I think because of the pawn structure or... Uh... Yeah, pawn structure. Not so white's king is kind of stuck. Like you don't really play king g3 right away because knight c4 loses the pawn. And black's king is more free. Like black king can can play some like b6, give up maybe g7 pawn and just activate the king right away. Getty, I think that Anna is ready to make a draw. Mm -hmm. The body language says... Let's call it a day. Now the question is, what about what about letting G? Are you happy with the draw? What do you want? Again, there you go, this question. What do you want from this game? So draw is good for the match strategy. But one thing I can absolutely definitely say is that once later in the match or maybe in the tournament, you come back, uh, uh, let's say you, you make some mistakes, uh, you lose mm -hmm. a game, maybe mess the entire tournament and then you look back at that moment right you look back yeah. at that moment that game why did not i fight it out and this is a very very common thing and uh especially it happens at a professional uh level with the uh, professional players in open tournaments so let's say you start to make some draws let's say you make a draw with black you had a good position you were not sure yeah. maybe it's winning or not and then you lose the next game or the final game, whatever, and that's it, the tournament is over for you. And you regret, really, that you did not really fight it out. So here, of course, I think that leading G sh should be happy with the match strategy. But again, remember, she did play the aggressive E6. Maybe the mm -hmm. mindset is that she wants something to happen in this game, and she might not agree yeah. to repetition. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree because uh, what we have seen at the beginning, how fast she was playing and how aggressive moves she was playing, and she totally changed the direction of the game. That's true, that she might want more. But also, on the other hand, if position is not giving her too much, um, maybe she would just just uh, try tomorrow uh, and also Arthur's for for many players I know that um, they have this strategy to hold in a classical chess because yeah they there's they are grandmasters they're very strong players guys uh, and then uh, not to have not to spend too much time uh, for the preparation in that part but instead to uh, train the rapid and blitz portion that also happens for the players who are going to the World Cups. And for those players who are playing World Rapid and Blitz, they have massive trainings for just Rapid and Blitz. They have their repertoire in that uh, segment. And uh, I would not be surprised if one of these players have this strategy here, just to hold in a classical chess. It's a long uh, time control, anything can happen. And then to be super strong and just to get ready for that portion and surprise your opponent. Right. What do you think? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what she is going to do because um, I think the rule should be as long as you are not risking, you should continue. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe she's just trying to evaluate, okay, uh, maybe I can decline it, maybe I can continue. I mean, probably it's sort of equalish, but if I can set some problems to my opponent, I should try to do it. Because there's also this thing as the psychological effect on your opponent as well. You decline the offer, you play the black, you're saying no. So what does it yeah. do to your opponent, right? It's quite unpleasant. There you go, 95 is on the board. So leading is all about business. Wow, <laughs> Knights to e5. So that means that the repetition 
from late Ting Li. At least next move was declined. She goes 94, kind of forces Rook G7 to happen here or Rook F8. What is her idea? She wants to play Knight C4 next and get B2 pawn or E3 pawn. Is that what she's hoping for? Yeah, yeah. I, I was showing this on the board. So knight c4 is the idea of knight b2, knight e3. The, the game is still about level. It's about equal. About the psychological blow, I think we are going to talk about in uh, something like several minutes because now it's the time, dear viewers, uh, to go for a very, very short break. I know this is a, a lot of action happening right now. The game should have could have finished in a draw it did not so me and katie we're going to be back in several minutes hope you're enjoying the show so far don't go anywhere stay tuned with us and see you in several minutes now you can use gifts from the biggest chess stars on all your favorite platforms just search chess.com and your favorite chess star on discord twitter whatsapp and more to find hundreds of gifts from chess.com's biggest broadcasts and events Nepo, Danya, Fabi, Anna's, and even me, Danny. Try it today.
back everyone this is 2022 FIDE women's candidate tournament pool a semi-finals Anam with a trick versus Leiting G here we have the end game and here we have the Chinese player on the screen she's very focused she just declined to repeat the position and we kind of have a feeling that she wants to fight for more here we are Arthur and Katy, and we're now going to take a look uh, closer at the uh, one of the participants and we're going to choose at this time Leiting Xi and let's see how she qualified to this tournament a little bit more information about her uh, Arthur, as we mentioned that she's 25 years old and so far she is the youngest participant of the field and she is number six right now by her rating her rating currently is 25 34 and uh, as we mentioned she has qualified to here by winning fide women's grand swiss tournament which yourself also participated in the open section right uh, so that indeed was a very impressive uh, uh, result by Lei Ting Ji, and uh, she completely crushed the tournament uh, she's also the youngest player in the field uh, so still not so experienced at this highest level but i think she's definitely going to be a very serious force to reckon with uh which she already pretty much stated by winning the grand swiss uh, and uh i i love the i love the choice right uh, i i think also us the commentators we are looking for a great fight uh, sure uh draw would have been the perfect choice from the match strategy uh, th this point of view but uh I, I love I love this fighting spirit and actually I think it does make perfect sense with the entire attitude that she came for this game. She played something sharp, she was ready to play some uh, mainstream theory right after the opening. She played E6, uh, she was ready to get some whatever she prepared. I don't know, was it uh, Nidorf? I'm oh, sorry, what Nidorf? Was it Taimanov? Was it Sicilian yes. Khan? I have no idea. Maybe Khan? We don't know. Maybe we we're gonna see in the tie breaks, but she's means all about business. And now after Knight X on E3, she continues to press. But I still do believe the game is pretty balanced. It is pretty balanced indeed. Uh, before the game, uh, going to the uh, uh, clear position, uh, let's let me use this time to um, tell you guys very interesting fact about. Uh, uh, Lei Ting Ji, uh, in 2014, um, some years ago, she won the fourth Ch uh, China Women Masters Tournament. And it is interesting that she beat it in the tie breaks, Zhu Wen Jun. Uh, so, um, uh, who is the current Women's World Champion. And after that uh, tournament, she was awarded Women's Grand Master. So that was 2014. And then uh, some years later, she got the Grandmaster title and uh, there was not big difference. Like usually when you get one title, then it passes a lot of time. Uh, but in her case, it was just uh, about three years. In 2017, she was awarded as a Grandmaster. So I think that's pretty impressive how fast she is progressing. And there's also one very minor achievement which you're probably not aware of. Um, uh, she was playing whichever year it was, 2016, 2017, maybe 18, in Riga Technic mm -hmm. University Open, where she was playing one of the local grammasters, which is me, and she demolished me. So oh that, no! Yeah, that is that is my memory of how I <laughs> came to know who is Leiting G, and, and you know, <laughs> Kenny, what it made it even worse. Okay, so whatever, I lost the game. It happens, right? It was a very beautiful game, and then my dear teammates in France they showed me later when I was in France a picture from the local magazine where my entire game was analyzed in detail. Uh, whatever, Ooh. I don't remember the title. La Belle, beautiful, crushing victory. It didn't really help. <laughs> whatever. But, I mean, she already was an amazing player back then. Pardon me, I don't remember the year. I could check it, which year. I think something 2017, 2018. But already back then, I knew that she's definitely going to be one of the best players in the world. 
Yeah, I'm sorry for that, Liz. Oh, something girl. like when something like that happens, you always uh, remember. I, I have way pleasant memories with her. In <laughs> a lot of talks and chats and so on. Oh, I've never had a chance to to play, but uh, yeah, you know how how strong actually she is. And in this game, um, is there any chance that Anna might also should be fair of uh, of her? in this very end game. All right, so let's check how the game might actually continue. So I think King E1 doesn't make a lot of sense to leave the Queen's opponents being easy targets. So it's gotta be King C1. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do here? I guess you take the Rook, right? Also, Arthurs, if Black wants to play after King E1, just to make a draw, you can take this pawn with a Knight and then make a draw in that way uh but there's more things under attack i mean yeah. i could i could you're right you're right kitty yeah you're right you're right but let's imagine that uh black is a bit ambitious right I think yeah we want more yes we want more yeah so we are gonna take it here i don't know where the rook has to go i think this is perfectly reasonable idea to attack this pawn threaten with some checks by the way and knight c4 now this pawn on b2 is under attack so it's a very logical that white wants to activate the knight but listen you can't do it spoiler alert there's a checkmate in one Ooh. oh don't do that that's, it's not gonna happen that's that's yeah that's sad and um but what do you do yeah um, like those pawn pu probably pawn push but it also weakens the queen side yeah and I play something like knight c5. I know how it goes. I mean, you have to play the active, the, the active defense. Take it here. No, this is not a dead draw. Wait, wait, wait. This is not a dead draw. I don't, I don't agree with what the bar says. The bar says black is slightly better. Come on, you have to work on that. Uh, this is definitely a zero risk game for black. King c1 has been played. We might say. Uh, the position which had on the board in the game as well as now uh, the pawn on c2 should be captured probably there is no rook g1 check as king runs away on d2 and there's not too much danger rook takes king has to go on b1 mm -hmm. and now black just needs to move this rook away to the smart square i think h2 is is smart enough to go yeah maybe g2 i'm not sure any... Yeah, but what move, right? What move to make? It's not easy. I think I think rook to g7 here to go after g6 pawn. So I would I would allow you to give me a check and then I will cover it with the knight knight f1. No, okay. Sorry, knight c1. Okay, Kenny, you can win. Spell. I'm gonna play rook g2. <laughs> that was the second idea. Yeah, yeah, maybe this is something uh, that we don't know what to play next move here with white. Ugh. And if I play here. With the idea of knight c4, knight e3, let's say here and here. Uh, here. Right. And uh, here. And uh, here. Still not a draw. <laughs> Still no. not a draw. I mean, somehow black is pushing me. He has the more active pieces. Of, yeah, he, he actually she does and uh there was a moment when anna played very quickly king d1 can we just go back for a moment at that point here uh, could she play here king to c3 not to have so passive king all right uh king c3 and if i play here i'm claiming king d2. i want a tempo which maybe means nothing mm. You know, I I have a theory here, Kitty. Is that I have a yeah. feeling, I have a feeling that Anna slightly underestimated that black. And I thought that so she, yeah, 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 yeah. I that's that's said. my theory here because she thought, okay, I, whatever. She played so quickly. This king he wants, like, okay, mm -hmm. let's let's do this. This is a match. Uh, you're happy with the draw. Let's do this. I'm not happy with the draw. So be it. And maybe she was a bit a bit care careless. Uh, because indeed, it's a very legit question. Why not? Uh, why not King C three? And after King C three, Rook G three. Maybe she discarded this. She felt that 
she's essentially entering the same position uh, down a tempo because Black just won a tempo with Rook uh, G3, Rook H3, right? I think so, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it the king is on the uh, d one, d two on this set of d one, and it, at that positions we were playing knight c five, so that's very important tempo that we were using with this knight. Yeah, knight c five attacking the pawn, knight e six, and so on and so on. But this position uh, feels quite quite harmless for white. No, I mean it feels that white is pretty safe. I mean I don't imagine that these pawns, the turtle pawns. The H and G pawn, they're going to crawl forward really fast. I can't really believe it with the Rook and G7 standing there, stopping them. So, and the White is going to have a lot of time for counterplay of Knight C5, Knight E6. So, really, I think that this was probably one of the, if not the only, where, where did we go? Here we go again. So, one of the, if not the only mistake that Anna has done so far, she did believe that the opponent is going to repeat the position. And now, to her horror, she realized the opponent can actually continue to play for the win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Leiting G is investing in her time. She is taking her time now at this point, four minutes uh, has been already spent. And uh, she does have 27 minutes for now. Um, yeah, I don't still believe there will be any time, any kind of time problem for any of the players. Um, but the position can get somewhere awkward here for white, indeed. Yeah. So here, black is choosing between rook c2 and knight c2. I don't think it's very obvious what's the right choice. Because the point of knight c2 is you want to play next knight b4 attack the pawn and this comes directly with the threat of 93 so you want to make sure that you see all of the active moves from the white's perspective i think something like knight c5 should be very obvious move right so white is going for a yeah. counter attack attacking this pawn you're checking some tricks you know you check if you can play knight b4 etc and if this knight makes as far as e6 there's definitely no chance for black to win this so she has to take the rook no did yeah, she? she has to take uh, yeah, it she, with the rook. Did. I think it was it. King b1 has been played very fast. There's no point to think here at this point when you have only one move left. And now this is the moment when Alei has to decide where to bring the rook. We like rook g2 or rook h2. Uh, Black cannot play pawns here uh, as then rook e7 will uh, just uh, attack the knight and the rook at the same time. So rook move is pretty much forced and she goes rook to g2. This is deep. I like it. I mean, because uh, uh, she is uh, uh, improving our idea, which we picked up a bit later, that white might be willing to trade this pawn. So rook h2 is a very natural response. But black is thinking like, okay, listen, I'm going to keep this pawn on g6 alive. I don't care about the pawn on h3. The big prize is here, the queen side. I need these pawns. So knight c4 or maybe even knight e1. The rook g1 is also a very big idea. And that is unpleasant for Anna. Maybe knight c1 is the right move, but this is looking so passive. You just don't want to make this move. Do no, you? it's super, super, super passive. Unless you don't have any other useful moves, you can do it. But, oh. I no, see a lot of ghosts much. here. Yeah. You know, one of the things uh, which probably Kelly are also going to agree uh, all of the players have experienced this the so-called you see start to see ghosts you start to see ideas which which are not there but it looks so scary you start to have these checkmate ideas knight c3 rook c2 checkmates on a2 etc and it's very easy to discard something which maybe is equal but it looks just not very logical yeah, and you would never imagine that so much mess could happen with only Rook and the Knight. Those two pieces can done so much uh, damage to the opponent. But uh, it's I think in the end game, Knight and the Rook is one of the best combinations. They can set up so many mating threats together. Yeah, and also here, White has to psychologically gather. Yeah, there, there's no denying that probably the biggest. Uh, the biggest problem for White is that uh, she's being pressed in the game where she's supposed to press herself. So yeah. that, that is a, yeah, that is unpleasant. Yeah, for those who just joined us, uh, we are 
telling this because we have seen we have witnessed the first two moves and we have seen Anna's reaction how visibly uh, disappointed she was with the choice of lay here as she went to Sicilian not to Petrova and then second disappointed person is Arthur indeed as he was so prepared with the stories about Petrov and the lines and everything <laughs> so, so um yeah and there was there was something really very much visible that Anna took a lot of time at the very beginning on the move two she was also thinking for knight f3 and then knight and then g3 move three she was she was taking more time uh so that's the reason why we're saying that she was surprised and she needs to put herself together still up up to this point another shock she got was that when lay uh denied to repeat the moves so right yeah it, it's bit... always unpleasant right it's always unpleasant. Yeah. i mean there was no verbal offer but it's like when you came in an agreement with yourself, okay, I'm ready to make this mm -hmm. game finish in a draw, and your opponent says no. Uh, it yeah. might seem not much, but uh, sometimes you just <clears> collapse <throat> very quickly, right? I'm, I'm hoping Anna is not going to do that, right? I'm hoping really to see some of the best chess here, but it's unpleasant, and I'm pretty sure she feels unpleasant. But talking about the actual moves here, I think King C1 has to be played. What do you think? So that after just to repeat the yeah repeat the moves, yeah King no, no, no. Yeah, two King one to repeat the moves, but the big idea so that I have this knight idea to play knight c five. Oh wait, do I? I just take it. Actually, actually, um, no? rook h four here. Uh, this is somehow working for you, yeah, and a a three. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I found a way to blunder. Okay. <laughs> okay, not very good. Once again, here. So knight c5 is a big blunder. Checkmate in one. Hey, think... why not rook h4 here? Rook h4. So wow. this is very, very sneaky idea. First of all, I'm avoiding knight c4. I want to control fourth rank. I want to give some checks if I need. And also, when you leave the knight, I have this rook to g4 idea. So how about rook g4 here? You uh, you don't care about the pawn on b2. Well, if wow, you take with a... the rook, I will play king to c1. <laughs> and if I take this, this, this rook and I hunt a pawn, it could be risky for you, no? Something like yeah. B6 and truck. I'm oh, sorry, wrong arrow. Here. Oh my god. Oh, just a second. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. And the king runs to five so that I don't allow any knight C5. I do agree it's quite joyish. Well, how about just to trade the pawns on, on queen side and then sacrifice the knight? Although, like it's black is the one who is pushing for sure. Yeah. But I like it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a nice idea. I didn't spot it. So rook h4 to defend against uh, knight c4, but also keep an idea for g4. It looks a bit weird to be honest, but it works, I guess. Um, yeah. so Anna has plenty of time. This is move move 30, 30 moves have been played, and uh, she just needs to watch out for this check. The knight c4 idea. To be honest, I think king c1 is a bit more human. I mean, uh, it prepares the knight c5 idea, but then again, you know, <laughs> I look at the position, there is no knight c5, there's the rook c2 check next. Yeah, you're kind of waiting your opponent to make a move, yeah, after king c1. Yeah, something like g5. Yeah, for instance. And then I could And we don't him. have rook h4 anymore. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah. And if uh, th there's also this idea, if I play h4, I could just go past it, g4, and my g pawn suddenly is very strong. Mm, we have actually a suggestion in the chat. So uh, I think there is knight f2 instead of knight f3 wins a pawn on h3. Could we could we go for that pawn? Or so Where? knight d1 to attack the pawn there and knight Here? to f2. Yeah, uh, I think at this point. Ah, rook h2. Yeah. And then you want to take with the knight. Yeah, this looks quite scary, to be honest. I mean, the bar is unimpressed. I'm quite 
quite used to that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't argue it should be a draw. It's quite. Oh, dwarfish. she goes for it. Crook to h4. She checks the clock. How much time she has spent? She has spent uh, quite a lot of time. As now she uh, took over lay on the clock. This would not would not be under my radar. This rook h4. I tell you honestly, I think I think I would be looking at king c1. But there mm -hmm. there definitely was something that um, Anna didn't like. I don't know what. Maybe the point that after king c1, you just have no next move. And I, I think it's very yeah. important, Kelly, right? That you're looking for some sort of a clarity. You're looking mm -hmm. for ways to liquidate. And rook h4 is maybe a bit more forcing move. So you're not like waiting for something to happen. You're doing it yourself. And uh, the point here is you take care of this square. Rook e4 is next. And now the big question is, now what does happen after, indeed, what was it once again? Knight to d1. And also, uh, at this point, uh, rook, G rook g4 is not the only move you can play here, right? But we blundered. Okay, look at this. We blundered the pawn. I just noticed. Oh, and after g5, you have knight e4 and your pawn is just gone. White knight cannot really get closer to g6 pawn. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's illegal. <laughs> yeah, that's illegal. It's only legal in Blitz. No, not here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what was it? After 91, you can't play rook g4, then you lo lose a pawn. Um, hold on. There is this rook c4, rook c2 idea just to cover the uh, second rank. And then mm. to go it for h3 pawn, I think it's going to be like harder task for black. Oh, and then you want to play rook Ooh, g4. How about now knight c5 now? Looking for some checkmates out there. <laughs> nice. Actually, it's, it's pretty funny, right? Uh, Black also is thinking about checkmate ideas himself, right? For example, rook yeah. goes something like rook e4 and you, you miss a mate. And it's uh, actually white who checkmates. King a8, rook c8, checkmate. Of course, this is not going to happen, but it makes perfect sense to play something active as knight c5. And I play b6 and knight d3. Yeah, for instance. Rook goes here. Where's the draw? And rook d4. Rook d4 is knight b2. Oh, knight b2. Yeah, that's a pin. And there is no check because king gets closer to the rook. King c7. Right. right. I don't know. Maybe there's some. Oh, there is king, rook c1, king c2, crazy thing. But you are losing a pawn. No. Uh, I oh, think you're more. losing a piece. I think you're losing, <laughs> you're losing more. A piece. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to work. Okay, just a sec. How is this equal? Because the knight is under attack. I, I don't follow. Maybe just give up the pawn. You know, just play 95. Yeah, 95. Very logical, by the way. Attack the pawn and uh, knight b2, just play, yeah, rook c2. There you go. Mm. And actually, now white has all the fun in the in game because you have the outside pass pawn. Look at that. I mean, you're going to take a yeah. g6 and make the facial expression. You were the one pushing it, which is probably mm. right. <laughs> and start to calculate the pawn push there. Again is, uh, again, is disconnected. Yep, yep. It looks good. It's a great defense. Uh, yeah. But like we have seen so many still variations that can anything can get, can go wrong. Like even there are only two pieces left and few pawns. Things are still not ending and it's not a boring position at all. There is a question, very interesting question for probably many viewers who has not been at the over the board chess tournaments about um, uh, the uh, about the fact that the players are writing down the moves like after each move they are writing down and why that is necessary would you like to answer that uh what's the question actually i mean where was why it? players are writing down the moves oh um 
Actually, that's a very good question. I'm not even sure what's the nowadays the purpose really, uh, because uh, all of these games are transmitted on digital boards. So I would say it's more like a tradition. I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, really, because uh, of course it goes uh, historically wise that in order to record the games, you have to write them down, yes. and uh, they would be stored uh, or mainly by written form. Uh, those score sheets would be stored somewhere, and I still remember the good old times when all the games were uh, prepared. Uh, all the score sheets in very big, you know, like uh, score sheet books, etc. <laughs> but nowadays, with all everything going digital, I'm not totally sure. So I think there's something like a traditional value. That's it. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the thing is that uh, this high level tournament and top tournaments, there for sure. Uh uh transmitted with a digital board but not always digital board is accurate uh and for instance if there is some miss miss thing uh in the in uh, at some point where there is no time on the clock arbiter cannot interrupt the players so they have to send us for instance the moves right so at this point i have seen arbiters quite often checking the moves because they can see what players are writing down and they can fix them digital boards because digital board is quite sensitive and if uh, you place the piece wrongly it cannot read so sometimes pieces are disappearing from the board or some weird things are happening and arbiters have to fix it and they can't interrupt the players right in the game so one of the reasons is that and also another reason is that sometimes we have tournaments with 100 boards right and definitely we don't have 100 arbiters for each board so if there is a repetition for three times arbiter has to check it right and that's the only source that they can check if you don't write it down then they can't really check and yeah you i think you nailed it that's a brilliant explanation yeah i would never be able to come up with something like that <laughs> <laughs> i like right. to build up some stories <laughs> Very nice. no, this is this is this is for sure guys this is for sure but they are not they are not forced to write down moves in rapid and blitz though they are not yeah, uh, indeed, in in rapid and blitz, uh, but I mean, but some people still do it. They still write it down, uh, especially in rapid. I, I've even really? seen some some do it in blitz. You know, it's so crazy. But uh, yeah, yeah, people sometimes voluntarily take a score sheet, but it's not mandatory, not at all. I mean, uh, at least in rapid and blitz tournaments, you don't have to. But if you really like it, I'm sure. Yeah, why not? why not so we had the moves here rook h2 has happened uh -huh. so, so i guess basically yeah go ahead this is like uh Zugzwang. that's the idea of leading g so the, if the rook goes to e4 attack the knight i just take the pawn if this knight goes somewhere i give you a checkmate so i keep the idea of playing knight e1 and then when your rook goes, I can snatch this pawn. Now, this is really deep. And she just makes it look so easy. It's <laughs> unbelievable. And the bottom uh, language, I think yeah. it says it all, right? I mean, letting she's comfortable, she's enjoying it. Uh, even if yeah, she's so. not going to win this, psychologically, the advantage belongs to black. I mean, for the Chinese uh, player in this match already. Maybe it doesn't mean yeah, anything. Granted. Like it's like it has been easy day for Lei and it has been quite a challenging day for Anna. We don't really know how she, maybe it's really nothing that Lei chose a different opening, but it is just unpleasant. Of course, you would like to go the things on your way and today things are going on the way of Lei. We have seen much of uh, Conor Humby and uh, Anna Muzichuk went on Anna's way. So you just need to have your day and a bit of luck obviously you know in all the rounds uh but it's also very important to keep stability so even if you have a tough day this this is not tough for anna for, anna for sure it's just very unpleasant of these small um uh, 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 tricks that lay is putting up here it just uh, takes so much energy from uh, from anna to think through and then find the solution but the most important is to not to lose a game at this point when we have this uh, kind of type of tournament, yeah? 
Yeah, but also I think that uh, psychological effect of um, not getting the draw when she was ready to do it, it should be already passed. Now you mm -hmm. simply have a problem and you have to work with it, right? And that's it. I mean, you're a professional. You are trained to deal with situations like this. And uh, not always you get very pleasant positions. And actually, I do believe that uh, a big part of chess players' skill is to save slightly worse positions. And this is quite interesting because not many players are really so good with the defense because I think that uh, probably a vast majority at the professional circuit, they're very good when it comes mm -hmm. to converting a slightly better position, pressing when you're not risking anything, opponent has an unpleasant position, etc. But when you have to defend for hours and a long uh, time control, a lot of moves, like 100 moves, the same annoying, slightly worse position, not everybody can cope with this uh, mm -hmm. problem. Agree. Yeah, I agree, agree. Uh, about this uh, draw decline situation, uh, I had one one funny game when uh, one of the Georgian player, Women Grandmaster, offered me a draw during the game and I had slightly worse position, not bad position, slightly worse and unpleasant. And when she offered me a draw, I accepted. Why not? And uh, she started to be very mad at me, and I didn't understand why she was mad at me. Uh, and then she was, she told me that I thought you would um, uh, decline the draw yeah. for, and then I would get mad at you, and I would beat you because <laughs> I, I was like looking at the variations, and I couldn't find a way how to win. So I was like, maybe I need to have this spirit of fighting and she decided to do that by offering me a draw in a worse position like <laughs> that is a very flawed logic pardon me i don't understand it if you don't want a draw don't offer a draw it should be really <laughs> simple okay. i have to admit that i came up with this conclusion after like a few minutes to ask her questions if she really meant what she said and then yeah there was like it is quite unpleasant when you are offering draw and the opponent says no that's for a bit it's it's just maybe one more or two moves it affects you in a way yeah. and yeah she she wanted to get mad and i just saved one half a point so i was very happy <laughs> with that decision <laughs> Yeah, and uh, now now let's try to imagine ourselves in Anna's shoes. So what would you do? Now, what is thinking, I need to trade all the pawns. Or maybe just two of the pawns so that I can give away the knight. Let's say I trade these pawns somehow. Sorry. I trade one pair of pawns somewhere here. Then I give away the knight on b7. And then I enter a very easy theoretical draw, uh, rook against rook and knight. But mm -hmm. how do we get there? Uh, and then, of course, Anna knows that she has to play active. She knows everything about uh, passive defense, how bad it is, etc. So I'm pretty sure she's not uh, thinking about something like knight c1 unless she really has to. So how do you activate your pieces? Uh, Arthur, I'm thinking, like, for instance, let's to make some kind of pass move. And in fact, she plays king to... Um king to c1 the rook from h4 controls c4 square and king from c1 controls d1 square so at least b2 pawn now it's safe that's very logical but there's also another problem why mm -hmm. they still in the took twang so the only legal move you're going to have is knight e4 because knight c5 runs into a check okay maybe knight e4 is just good enough and uh, she just needs to make sure that, for example, this black king doesn't start to run towards this king side pawn. For example, something like g5, which, by the way, is... Ah, g5. Pretty annoying. You... Yeah. You play rook h5. You trade these And then g4? Which... g4? Oh, just take. Rook c... Just take. Oh! <laughs> there was rook h5. h5. It was a tricky move. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it uh, makes perfect sense. So g5, rook h5, I want to trade these pawns. I made sure there's no uh, rook h1 check, which maybe with a king on b1, the knight on c1 somehow is bad. So this is a very logical choice. And now, yeah, what do you do now? Maybe play knight c4. Well, this is, again, quite equal-ish. 
Well, I don't know. Check and I snatch the pawn. But I think it's safe here after knight c5. You are kind of forcing knight straight. Yeah. Um, I think it's also pretty logical from the black's perspective to activate a king, right? So also leading G should have a pretty good idea that it's not going to be enough with the knight on the rook. You need a king as well. Uh, but there might mm -hmm. be just not enough time, and that's why the bar says this is very equalish. So what if we try to run? What if we try to run? King c7, king goes somewhere closer. Can we do this? I think that's a very good idea. G5 has been played here uh, just to get rook this out of h4 square. This rook on h4 uh, is nicely controlling c4 square, and after g rook goes to h5, uh can black just pass another move and play rook to g2 at this point oh i yep. love this that's a great idea i think this is what she has in in her mind after h4 definitely there's going to be mm -hmm. g4 not to trade the pawns again i mean white is having problems with this knight and the longer anna is not going to be able to find a clear path towards a draw the more difficult for her it uh, becomes yeah, it, it can be really, really unpleasant ditch of these moves. Uh, we cannot play after g5, rook e4, right? Because we are dropping the pawn on h3 and the rook will uh, guard the knight. Um, can we now bring the knight into the game and just, yeah, but... just think that it's okay here to play this end game without pawn? Uh, are you sure you're going to make a draw there? Because I'm not. No, not at all. Yeah, that's why I think black is not uh, white is not going to do this. I mean, this is something that we could consider, but uh, if you're not sure the pawn, the G pawn is going to fall, I think that uh, Anna is never going to give up the pawn on H3 just for free. Maybe there's some checks that she's looking at. Rook H5 should be very logical, but. Yeah, but this makes also perfect sense. She's looking towards some, again, forcing moves. For example, check, here, check. Can I force a draw immediately? Oh, yeah, she's calculating some checks, as I can see on the bigger video right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and take, and take. Is this so obvious at all? Should be, right? That is a risky business, to be honest. Yeah, it Let's... looks drawish. You're just on time to get this king on the... Yeah, the king side, f2, yeah. king g2. No, no, this is going to be a draw. I think Anna should pick this up just a second. I, How was this once again? Check, check. here, check. Now, if you mm -hmm. go king b6, I give you check. I, I pin the king later, something like rook h5, h4, etc. At least that's an idea. Although bar, the engine bar found something like this, which is not very human. Check check and then suddenly your queen side pawns start to become easy targets and actually black is enjoying the king on b4 yeah that's very active king this king can win the game indeed okay Oof. okay so actually what happens after if i don't run with the king on d6 i go king b6 check and let's say okay rook h5 is not necessary i play rook h7 i go back it's a very logical defense. I think Anna should should be able to pick this up uh, without uh, too much of a sweat. There is also the possibility to play knight d4 check and then knight f3 to go after rook and the g5 pawn. Uh, that's another um, other thing too. Yeah, but I think also, Kelly, you need to watch out for this tactical trick, right? Always this check and whatever background issues. Oof. Yeah, yeah. that's right. This could be a problem, and I, I think also what Anna is probably experiencing here, uh, this uh, I can relate from uh, from the positions when you have like five ways to win the game. It's mm -hmm. the most difficult, the most difficult position to be in because it's like this is winning, that is winning, this is winning, this is huge advantage, <laughs> this is completely crushing. How do you choose? Are you just looking at all of that and you can't choose and? And yeah. Another thing is when you're checking all these lines and you find out that you're losing in a three ways, you kind of have a feeling that you are worse, right? 
So yeah. that gives you this kind of feeling that you are the one who is in a worse situation. And uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, maybe the position is itself. But, but okay, here, I think Anna is say. feeling pretty much similar, right? It feels that this position is a draw, like in like in ten ways. But how exactly do you make a draw? It's very confusing because it's easier. It's actually it might be strange to to you, the viewers, but it's easier when you just have one very clear way. Because you are a very good player, you're always gonna find it like one victory or one draw. You're gonna find it, but then you have like ten. And everything yeah. looks pretty much the same. It's very confusing. And of course, the bar is <laughs> laughing at us and saying, what are you doing there? But in a slightly worse position where everything is yeah. sort of drawish, it's very dangerous ground. It is, it is. And uh, it's always interesting how the players are, are feeling. What is the chance that Anna is feeling that she's worse here? And what's the chance that Lay is thinking that she's better here? Let's put it in that way. I think none of these players are thinking that this is equal position. <laughs> To be honest, they feel that it's slightly better probably for Lei and it's slightly worse for Anna. That's and, uh, in the end yeah, of the I... day, that's what really matters, right? They are not right. playing with the engine bars. Right. It's it's a very nice position. And uh, while they are considering their choices, Kathy, I think we are going to go for another break because I have a feeling that nothing is going to change in a couple of minutes. No big developments. Don't go anywhere. Uh, that is Ketty Tatsalashvili. I'm Artem Nekshans. I hope you're enjoying the coverage so far. Post your thoughts and remarks at the chat. We are following it. Thank you for being with us. Don't go anywhere and see you in a couple of minutes. Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a total beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing, but chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program that guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds, signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for? Chess Kid is fun. Chess is great for the brain, but it's also fun to play. And Chess Kid makes it easy to have fun. Whether your child is a whole beginner or a prodigy, they can hop on and find a well-matched opponent from around the world at any time. Chess Kid is the safe, parent-approved way for your child to play chess online. Chess Kid is educational. To kids, it feels just like playing. But chess is a great way to learn patience, strategy, and critical thinking. Chess Kid features a comprehensive training program guides kids to level up on their way to mastery. There are more than 50,000 chess puzzles and a whole library of entertaining videos that teach strategies, tactics, openings, and end games specifically for kids. Chess Kid is easy. Whether you're a parent helping your child, a coach managing dozens of kids, or a school of hundreds, signing up is free and easy, so what are you waiting for?
Welcome back everyone, this is 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament Pool A, Anna Muzicic and Leiting G on the screen. You might thought that uh, this game would end in a draw for you most earlier, half an hour ago, but no, it's nowhere close to end or to beat that draw. Here we have this end game with full of ideas. Here we are, Katie and Arthur at the commentary today, and we are going to reach 40 moves very soon. So let's once again take a look at the uh, format of the tournament. Check it out how this is working. Arthurs. Right. So there is eight players in total in the candidates. Pretty sure you already know that. This is the pool A, where four players are battling out in quarterfinals and semifinals. This is the semifinal of the pool A. So single elimination bracket. So the winner of the candidates cycle is going to play the reigning world champion, Juven Yun in the match and all of the matches here in the candidates tournament they consist of four games the first player to reach two and a half points wins the so-called mini match and at one says this is game one of the semi-final uh match first game of four games but of course if somebody makes it first to the two and a half points he at once says the final match of the candidates and a time control kitty the time control is what we call standard time control, where the players have one hour and 30 minutes plus 30 seconds for each move. And that's not all after 40 moves, which we are approaching quite soon. They're going to have extra 30 minutes, which myself, I find it very useful in, in many situations. And that's the moment you feel safe for next the third next 30 minutes so this is move 35 and so far it's it's not something that they are playing on the last seconds right no i mean the, they i think shouldn't feel any stress maybe if anna is gonna spend a little more time for the next two three moves she might feel some heat because it is a pretty notorious thing this 40th move which also was one of the uh, big dramatic moments in the quarterfinal match of uh, Anna Muzichuk against Konaru Hompi, where Konaru could have forced a draw at move 40, uh, a slightly logical move, but uh, for some reason, exactly move 40, Kenny, I don't know why not move 39 or 38, ex exactly move 40, which attracts all the blunders. It is. I have been in a situation when like in some of the turnouts and most of the turnouts, I was losing the games around move 40. One move before or one move after, that also happens. Or move 40, that's the last move you have to do. And uh, you are starting to be panicked a, a little bit. Uh, other moves like move 37, 38, 39, you are still fighting and you are just using every second to spend it well. And then when you're approaching move 40, that's when the panic starts in many cases. So uh, probably there was the reason as, as well in case of Connor. Anyways, she is also in the, from the competition and we have these two ladies facing each other in the first uh around and i have to admit that this game was uh, more interesting than i would expect it because i thought that we would have this petrol defense where they have like very equal position a lot of pieces there and they will just move around a lot wait when the time will drop down and then they could start to play very sharp games what is your uh, thoughts about this uh, a particular game um so far it didn't disappoint uh, i think there is mm -hmm. i think it's more interesting from the psychological point of view because chess is not only about making good moves uh so you want to be applying uh additional extra pressure to your opponent and uh, i find again to be very interesting how they played out the opening i like the psychological pressure that uh, uh leading g uh uh, pressed against her opponent also a very interesting moment was this when she declined the draw offer how anna got slightly careless in the moment when she could have played a bit more safe so probably now she regrets it yeah. and then now he she has to work on it and mm -hmm. uh yeah it's uh still a game it doesn't disappoint and uh, i think it as we already discussed it makes perfect sense that uh, 
uh, letting GE's continue to fight because she chose a very aggressive uh, approach in the opening, contrary to the Petrov defense, which we anticipated, but maybe we are still going to see it. I mean, who, who knows? Because if this match takes to the uh, game four, for example, letting G needs to secure a draw in the match. For example, let's say she leads the match 2-1. There's the fourth game. Mm-hmm. I think there's a very good chance she could play Petrov. Yeah, uh, and also another interesting fact uh, for those who just joined us, you mentioned that uh, you were checking of the games of uh, potential uh, coaches or seconds of Lighting G and all those players uh, are playing Petrov. So guys, we don't know who is the coach of Lighting G. She is uh, having coach online while Anna has coach here. And it's interesting fact that Anna and also Ma- Maria were having one coach. And uh, for me, it was the biggest uh, task to solve. Like what happens if they both win the games and go to the semifinals and face each other? Then what really happens? Because Arthur, I don't know if you have um, uh, noticed this, but in most of the tournaments they are making like not most all of the tournaments they're making draws like i have never seen at this point that they have fights it they needed to fight well so we are this... not gonna find it out are we <laughs> yeah not any day soon i don't know maybe in the future but that's that's very interesting situation like how this gonna go they are sisters and they are the sisters who are working together uh and they are supporting each other uh, a lot and um yeah that's that's something that i would like to see yeah i mean probably yeah. they, would <laughs> have to, they would have to fight at some point right and maybe i don't know we can speculate really maybe they would not fight the classical part try to play out some fast draws get it to the uh tie break whatever happens happens but uh i don't know i don't know i mean uh still uh somebody has to come out as a winner but it didn't happen so maybe as you say maybe in some future tournament it could definitely happen it's not happening here today and today here it's anna who has to uh, play against uh, leading g who defeated uh, her younger sister maria mozuchok in the quarterfinal match uh, it was very exciting and that's what we actually predicted that it's going to be petrov because against maria mozuchok leading g chose specifically the petrov defense yeah, that's right. Uh, meanwhile, while uh, we're chatting, they are spending more and more time on the clock. Lei seems to be a little bit tired or sleepy today. <laughs> she's, uh, yeah. she's more relaxed, I guess, because of also her position allows her while Lana is not seem to be any close to be relaxed. We can see both of the players now facing each other and yeah the the body language can can clearly say without the evil bar we can see here who feels has better position indeed so how do we make some progress for black um now king c1 has been played so black has positioned all the pieces optimally i guess it's got to be the king once again i mean we are not gonna discuss anything really sensational here so king c7 Hmm. check and now the big question do you sacrifice the pawn can you sacrifice the pawn here on b7 for the sake of running towards with the queen's pawn for example king d6 take it now again i dislaunch your king i love this sequence by the way rook h2 (laughs) and but it doesn't really feel there could be something for example, here. Ah, wait. You there's G four. You can push G four. Yeah. yeah, you can push G four. Okay, okay. Maybe, maybe not like this. Maybe I play Rook G seven, and then you could give me a check, maybe on H one or something. Nah, there's nothing. Yeah, very precise Rook G seven because I'm not so sure about Rook A seven. Rook A seven, mm-hmm. Rook H three and let's say you play something like rook g7 g4 is the king gonna be on time yeah and then knight to 94 knight f3 is or 92 is something yeah you can uh where let's play a4 let's play a4 here because we always struggle with this checkmate 
Uh, and now knight d4. I'm very fast. Ah, your idea is g to knight f5 check. That's your idea. Well, that was not my idea, but okay, it looks better. <laughs> yeah, because this is a draw. Just take, yeah. You can give up these pawns and uh, rook and knight against rook. Actually, black is going to be interested to keep one of the pawns on the board so that some of the tactical mating motives mm -hmm. uh, become available. Yeah, this is also a draw. What else? I think Anna should already know it by, by now. The idea. Mm -hmm. That's just fine. And she can also have this kind of possibility. She just needs to capture this uh, two pawn on the queen side and then give up the knight for the uh, G pawn. And she's still in the game. She's still in the game. Um, what are the chances Black she's thinking is... about something else? You look at uh, Anna, she having, again, the stare at the opponent. Like uh, Maybe she's thinking about something else, no? Because I, <laughs> I've heard stories that players sometimes during the game, they're thinking about Im unimaginable things, right? There's this very, very famous story called um, uh, Michael Tal. It was Michael Tal, yeah. right? He was uh, once in his game thinking about hippopotamus, how to get it out of the marsh. <laughs> yeah, and he was thinking really, wow. really hard about it, and uh, he tried to analyze. And he... Yeah, I mean, he was and analyzing. What was the solution? Uh, the solution he was considering uh, help of helicopters. You could try to get uh, mm -hmm. some external help to get it out, and in the end, he decided let the hippopotamus drown. So whatever, I mean, and then whatever he played. So it's really interesting, you know. It, it, it's funny, but uh, as a fact, uh, uh, when you have so much time on the clock, you start to think about various things because you have already <laughs> decided what you're going to play. The opponent is not making a move or something like that. 20, 30 moves, so you just have to do something, right? I mean, how many times can you calculate the same thing over and over and over? And that's why these funny True. ideas come to the mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I think is a different level. But what uh, what I know that I do is I'm when I feel I'm relaxed and I'm safe. I'm thinking uh, uh, what to play tomorrow. Like if I have the same opponent, uh, and before that I have another thought: what to eat tonight. <laughs> and I'm thinking so much about all of these things that sometimes things are getting worse and worse. So it's always better just to focus at one thing at the time and not went too far unless right. you are but again knight c4 yeah. is played knight c4 is on the board which um brings the question can you play h4 now can you play h4 because i see rook c5 check is this actually a legal idea oh i like that wait i'm not so sure it's actually good because i have Knight c5, we, it was still working. Uh, no, knight c5. Is where, where? Ah, again, you want to checkmate. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You always find checkmate ideas. Okay, knight c5, I play <laughs> here, check, here, you go here, and I win your exchange. Yeah, and why cannot really save, uh, save the rook here? There's no way. Okay, h4 is on the board. h4 is on the board. Oh, hold on, is there a rook g1 here? Wait. To give this check. The idea is that after king c2, you have this 93 move. Maybe you can find it useful. Uh, what check? Or why, check? We, why we need it? Yeah, why we need it, actually. Yeah, this check. We can just... Uh, okay, so g4 is probably push. not very good, right? So you drop a piece for nothing. What about... The, one second, let's check this. Is this, is this working? I think just to take the h4 pawn. But you lose the pawn on b2, no? Yeah, you lose the pawn on b2, but I think this is more safer because the, all the action now is on the queen side and uh, I don't think you are so worse here. And how about rook d2? Mm, yeah, it should be drawish. Well, I'm using the word drawish because... Should be a draw, right? Yeah, this should be a draw. I mean, but it's, again, it's this, a draw, yeah. Yeah, it should be a draw. But again, this is something that black can legally play until black is completely uh, 
when he decides he has it enough. I mean, you can play King B7, King B6, make 30 moves, push the pawn, push the pawn after 30 moves. You can play this position forever just to annoy your opponent. So this is not really ideal defense for uh, Anna because she's going to have to prove uh, that she has the draw, but maybe she didn't find anything else. So after H4... Knight oh, she goes Beedle. knight b2 right away? What? She's allowing her to capture the pawn on g5. Now, that is an interesting choice. And if I take it, I give a check. You go here. Check. <laughs> Kathy, we okay, have lost the count. How many times <laughs> in this game Litting G has used this resource? Rook c2, rook g2, yeah. or now it's rook b2, rook h2 with the background love issues. It, yeah. It's a great idea. Check this out. Anna is not happy. Look at this. She's yeah, not happy. someone just got some water from the snacks uh, table. And that's, that was the look I got as well. <laughs> Somebody send a <laughs> snack to Anna because she is not happy. Mm -hmm. Well, this means that uh, she's going to be in there for a long time. And actually, I love this decision by Leeting G because with the rooks on the board, pardon me, this is not an obvious draw, right? Of course, I mean, there's a very limited amount of material. The pawns are on the same side of the board, but you are still defending this very annoying position. And what it makes really unpleasant there is once again no clear way to draw you are just like you are extending the defense which you know should be a draw for unlimited amount of time and rely on the fact that your opponent has no progress that's it but you can't liquidate it which is extremely unpleasant position probably we've overused this term already today but that's what it is it's very unpleasant mm -hmm. for Anna. I, I I can't agree more. So she actually decided to capture G5 pawn with a pawn. At least we don't have this sequence of uh, check and then to attack the H pawn. At least now the pawn on G5 is guarded. Knight to D3 check has happened. Arthur, what happens if he ki if she king keeps the king in the center, King D1? But anyway, she went to King B1. We're never gonna know. <laughs> We're never, We're never gonna, know. gonna know. Yeah. So okay, what if we give a check here? Check here. Now we need a smart move here, here, and White says, "I'm gonna keep the pawn on g5. You're not gonna have it. Are you? By the way, check, check, um, check. King a3, knight to attack the knight." Are you not afraid? Not at all. No? <laughs> G6. I liked this uh, oh, trick you, you oh, made for oh, me. Okay. <laughs> I missed something. No, this game is going to continue um, for quite a bit. Now, if you want to show somebody how looks a relaxed player, show Leiting G right now. I agree. I agree. She is very comfortable in this very position. It's risk free. It's risk free for her. Uh, never had any uh, any challenge today. Uh, that was very easy, and uh, she had black pieces. So that's a very important detail here. And it is. We are talking how important it is um, in chess to have some psychological uh, advantage. And what you, that's what you need. You might not win the uh, game, but you need to feel that you are the one who is not defending. You are the one who is attacking. So I think Anna needs to pull herself together and come back tomorrow with another kind of like mood, I think, as well. Like today she was visibly shocked. Yeah. Knight f4, so Leiting G says she's going to go after the pot on g5. Perfectly logical choice. And maybe White can't even keep the pawn alive. Because I think, again, Anna this definitely doesn't want to enter a position where Black keeps the rook on, rooks on the board. 
for example, let's say something like rook h4, knight e6, and whatever. Just some random position. Let's say this, here, and here. This is the last position that Anna wants. Because black can legally play this position forever. I mean, black is not mm -hmm. going to trade the knights. Black is not going to trade the rooks. Slowly, b6, a5, king b7, king a6, some tactical tricks, etc. Incredibly annoying. So, if uh, possible, here Anna is looking for ways. Okay, I don't care about the pawn on g5 maybe so much, but I want to trade the rooks. Now, how do I do it? How do I do it? Maybe I can trade this pawn for this pawn. How do I do it? So, give a check here, give a check here, give a check here, and then what? Maybe go back. <laughs> I did not expect it to stop at this point. You were so excited to say so. I thought like the, it's, it will be some kind of like <laughs> final, uh, final uh, blow. But then there was a tricky question asked. Yeah, rook a h seven seems okay. But then like how about how about this king gets very active? Ah, uh, no, you want to go B4. for the mate, yeah? Yeah, oh, but it's not possible. It's not really possible. Rook to seven is the move that you have. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely no mate. And actually, white is up a pawn, by the way. So, uh, you know, Keddy, uh, we have to go back to the sequence. I'm not so sure that uh, knight f4 was the right move. She could have uh, applied more pressure, maybe, somewhere, somehow. No? We like this check, yeah? Rook, rook b2. Or we have already done Wait, that. Wait, but what we about. We have already done that. Yeah, but we're trying to make work this idea. Check here and knight b4. Why not mm -hmm. this? Why not this? Why not go after the pawn? Okay. Uh, the thing was, I think rook to king to b two and king to a three. Yeah, and after knight a two g six, this knight is just kind of, yeah. Maybe that's why. Yeah, knight is kind of trapped there. Yeah, maybe that's why. Because uh, probably. Yeah, you're you're right, Kitty. Probably Black realized there's nothing. I mean, as tempting as it is to win the pawn on A2, have two connected pass pawns, uh, White saves the game because of uh, pushing the G pawn. The knight on A2 is going to be disconnected, or just uh, White gives a lot of checks and, and these pawns simply fall. And that's why. Okay, she probably suspects again this is a draw, but. Uh, and also another thing, Carter, no, which is. Uh obvious for me when the pawn black pawn on the king side is gone there's less problems for white right uh so there's many situations it can be a draw it can be knight end game it can be a rook end game and sometimes even pawn end game is a, is a draw when we have pawns on the same same flank and why just play rook h4 and rook, not rook h8 and this means that black suddenly has slightly better position which means nothing really you are tricking us. You are tricking us. I thought there was some some line. <laughs> There's nothing. Ah, second <laughs> time already. No, no. I mean, I mean, there was a. I think this was a draw already. Check, check. Uh, give just a lot of checks. Uh, so maybe check and just go here. But I think that Anna maybe was a bit concerned. There could be uh, some seek. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, consequences for pushing the black king towards the white king. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some checkmate idea. I don't know. So you're not sure about that. And instead she played rook h4. And now can I keep, get this ideal position that I'm dreaming about? Now, these checks are not the same now, are they? Check? I think, I think we should keep the rook on uh, c file. Well, to avoid all the, all your dreams. Well, where's the rook on c file? Are oh, you mean like uh, after nine? Yeah, rook c four now, and where the king goes. And now to bring the knight once again, we'd like this move. <laughs> <laughs> they suggested this couple of times. Uh, you really must have loved this idea. Must be loving this. Idea. Yeah, but also like here, Arthur, when you play b six, then you have ninety six, and this pawn on g five will be guarded by the knight. So, actually, that's a brilliant point. I'm starting to like your white's position. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, just a second. How did that happen? So g5, <laughs> knight e5, rook c4 check, king b8, knight c5, b5, not b6. I don't know. b5? I don't know. By the way, very, yeah. very precise move. 
B5. Yeah, I do like this. With sometimes like B4, Knight C3 ideas, yeah? Yeah, B4, Knight C3, the pawn on NATO is under attack. What is still not out of the woods? Wait, what is that still not out of the woods? Because once again, you've played something like... Yeah, what do you play? So, Rook Knight C3... 97, 97 first, I guess, yeah? 97. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's execute your idea. 97, <laughs> King B7 uh could be rook c5 but the problem is you can't really take on g5 because there's king c6 unless there is a move oh check this out Katie. yeah oh and then you play rook to wow. b7 and you're taking a seven pawn nice. oh come on that is really deep yeah it is if this is the best defense for why this is pretty deep i mean you can easily miss it and she played something. Mm -hmm. She played knight d6, which is... Nice. Actually, that's even better for this, um, my idea, <laughs> knight c5. It kind of forces black to trade the knights, right? Because after king b8, now knight c5 is, uh, is the move. So mm -hmm. she goes king to d7. Okay, this game is so... over. Yeah. Yeah, knight c5, please. Knight c5. Knight c5. Knight c5. Don't play uh -huh. anything else. I think she's going to find it. It's a very obvious move, even without the pawn on g5. Now, this is a dead draw. Yeah. This game is going to finish in a couple of moves. Maybe this is the final move. So, move 41. 41. The players reach. Yeah, that's it. That's it. This game, the game is about to finish here. You don't play it out until the end. Rook c5, you can legally offer a draw. Even if black wins the pawn on g5, this is, this is it. And actually, I think that uh, letting g missed some minor chances 96 was slight inaccuracy missing her 0 0.11 advantage and now it's just a dead draw yeah was it a draw for her? no not no. yet they might play a couple more moves maybe find some what do you think who will offer first <laughs> maybe out of spite no no player is gonna offer it Possible, like you, yeah. you need to have this psychological edge to carry out to the next game. So I don't think that Leiting G wants to lose it. And uh, Anna is not going to give her the pleasure. <laughs> so they're fighting it out. <laughs> yeah. I remember when I played my first international tournament, uh my coach and my parents taught me how to offer draw because i didn't know how to offer draw i only knew how to offer in georgian don't but don't do it like this don't, don't do it like this because once <laughs> i was playing a tournament my opponent did it like yeah. this i was what the yeah. are you doing there because that's how i know it's you to offer a draw no but you can verbally offer a draw like there's a couple of ways to do it Rimi, uh some international players have used a lot of times nichia they have learned it from the Russian language or draw. Right? I'm I'm Georgian. I don't have no. I had no knowledge of any of these things no. when I was kids. So. But but this is the worst, really. This is the worst you can do. I don't know what it even means. So it's like uh, some. Okay, there you go. There's a draw. Take. Yeah. Draw great. There is a draw for the first game of the semifinals at the women's candidate tournament. Pool A has been ended. In a draw was not peaceful game at all. It was very deep uh, uh, positional game. A lot of hidden tracks and checkmates and the forks as we have seen and illustrated on the board. And um, I'm very happy to have such an interesting game as a first game out of four games that uh, we're gonna have at this point. Very, very fun in game indeed. So uh, just to round it up, it started as a very shocking choice by the Chinese Grandmaster, she played c5 and not the Petrov as we anticipated, clearly aiming for a sharp of fight. Now it was Anna who decided to sidestep for the g3, as I call it myself, the Baltic Croatian, which led immediately to a quiet opening. And the critical choice probably after the opening was bishop c5, where Anna didn't play queen e3, which I, I think it's a pretty principal choice. Instead, she played knight b3, which led to massive trades and then Probably the game was quite ticklish until the critical moment. Uh, Anna slightly rushed, and I think it was where was this? Can you help me here? I think it was after uh, we did the check. She played King B1 yeah. in belief that this is going to be a draw immediately. 
She thought that at this point the game uh, would end in a draw, but Lei start just tried. Lei just uh, tried to her best. Very likely she knew that it was not too much, but she knew that she was the one who was attacking and Anna had to defend. Um, why not to give a try and uh, let your opponents to make mistakes? But yeah, no mistakes uh, has been played today. Maybe a little bit in accuracy, but no mistakes. And here you have the first draw in the first game of out of four games. We're going to have three more uh, rounds to go. In case if one of these players scores two and a half point, it means that the player is the winner of the match. If it's a tie 2-2, then we're going to have another day of the tie breaks and we're going to have rapid portion of a day. But yeah, that's uh, that's it for uh, for today, I guess. It was uh, great. That's it. Great this game. is it. The game is finished and uh, we are going to be back tomorrow. The usual time, which is, uh, what was it? Please say, Kerry. I, I keep forgetting. I think At it was. At 3, we are starting uh, Central Time, 3 p.m. Central Time. 3 p.m. Central European Time for Americans. It's slightly earlier, pardon us. And uh, it's going to be, again, Kerry and me. We are going to be back in action tomorrow. And um, uh, we absolutely enjoyed your positive comments uh, in the chat section, of course, as we said a couple of times. We are watching what you're saying. We really, really literally care what you have to say. And uh, uh, if you have some interesting insights, uh, don't hesitate to let us know how you're feeling. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And uh, a huge event is coming up on chess.com. So let's shout out to that. The chess.com Global Chess Championship is coming to the uh, to head in Toronto. Live finals begin tomorrow, November 2nd, with 500k on the line. Who will win it out on top? After the upset, we have to see throughout this tournament. It is truly everyone's game. Don't miss it out. Uh, CGC finals can start tomorrow and with special guest appearance as well. Uh, such as Fabiano Caruana, myself, I was quite tricked yesterday or the day before. I thought there was the list of the players as I saw Caruana <laughs> on the on the list. But in fact, he's going to be a special guest uh, and a commentator. So you guys stay tuned on the TV, chess TV slash chess, the most epic chess championship going to start. Uh, here on this channel tomorrow and I know that you can't wait already for that but don't forget to come back to us and check, check us out as well because this is 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament the uh, winner of this pool gonna face the winner of the pool uh, B and then the winner of that final gonna face the world champion June in June. So that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, all the viewers. Thank you so much, Arthurs, for all this commentary and, of course, the um, whole production team of Chesscom who put this show together. And you guys, it's final goodbye from us and see you tomorrow, same time and same place. See Bye. you tomorrow. Goodbye.